or not models you have set up, but what's, um, what's running on in the background of the behave, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And what's going on in the background of behave is very, very important because it gets you to certain uh, places. So, all right, there you go. How many you got? Three? Three. Well, we got one seat up front here, one in the back, and like this and then mess around with yourself. Good to see you guys. Good to see you again. Uh, okay, so okay, so these are the main inputs. You're always gonna have a uh, you're always gonna have a fuel model input. <clears throat> How many of you would say you're familiar with the fuel model? A little bit? I should have brought should have brought the fuel model books on the I'll show you where you can get to them online. Uh, I've got a few copies of them. I, you know what it's something I, I didn't even think about bringing but I should have brought some copies of. Uh, we might be able to scare up some copies a little bit later for you. But it'd be a good thing for you to have, so there's two main fuel model books. There's the standard 13 fuel models that have existed for a long time. Those are the Hal Anderson fuel model. Uh, actually, they're older than that, but whatever. People call them the Anderson fuel models. Um, those are the older school fuel models. They're all static models, that is. They're all very, uh, there, isn't, there isn't much, they don't change. With, with different moisture regimes. Uh, they're, very, they're very much designed for use in the summer when, um, you know, when it's peak at dry, when things are at the driest, that's what they were designed for. They actually don't work that well for prescribed fire, even though we use them for prescribed fire pretty often. And then there's the, uh, then there's the 40 fuel models, which are the Scott and Bergen fuel models. So, uh, let's see, so these arrows, see these little blue arrows? All these little blue arrows, you can click on all of them and they bring up information for you. So for instance, I'll click on this fuel model uh, and it brings up, and most of the time it brings up a pick list. So for instance, for the fuel model, it brings up this pick list. And so the first fuel model, or the first fuel models that are here, it's, see the value where it says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? Okay, so those correlate to the first 13 fuel models. So fuel model 4 is Chaparral. Um, Chaparral. Uh, fuel model 4 Chaparral is what was used for a very, very long time. It's kind of the standard for the Chaparral around here. Um, but there isn't much diversity with that. And then where it, see where it says S right there? That means static. Versus if you go further down here past 13 uh, and see how the sort values go over to 101, then all of a sudden you're getting into grass 1, grass 2, grass 3, grass 4. On down the line, these are the 40 fuel models, and there's a lot more variability here. And there's actually D, which is a dynamic fuel model, which we can mess around with that sort of thing later. I'm not sure if there's any examples or not. But uh, the point of bringing this up is that these are the fuel models that are available to you. You have the first 13, and then you have the second 40. And so you need to know what your inputs are. Whether say you're say say you're writing a burn plan, you know you need to choose what fuel model you want to use, and that's what fuel model you choose in a burn plan writing, and then you start to run your uh, you run your outputs from there. I mean, it all goes back to what fuel model you choose, and if you choose the wrong one, or if you choose something that is not applicable, then all the data you get from it afterwards is going to be crap, basically. So you really need to know the most appropriate fuel model to put in here. Okay, and then you start getting into your moisture regimes, and so if you click on the arrow by the moisture regimes, and I encourage you guys to do this with your computers too as we go along, or, or whatever, however you learn best, but get used to pressing these buttons. So what it does when you click on the arrow by the fuel moistures, or, or herbaceous moisture, or woody moisture, or any of these, is it brings up, it says from, through, and step. So you can do, oh, and on the top here, see where it says 1 to 60? 
that is the range that you could put in. So if you put in 61 and press OK, it's going to say, oh, you made a mistake. Okay, it's outside the limit. It says the from field entry is outside the valid range of 1 to 60. So it automatically tells you, and this can be pretty useful sometimes, especially when you're doing your pre-work problems. Uh, it can help you decide what numbers to use or what numbers, what the range is. So 1 to 60 is available, so you know you put like 26. Okay, that's cool. Actually, you know what, let's go ahead and, uh, what do I want to do? Yeah, let's just do a very simple sort of input just to show a quick overview. Sound good? Alright, so let's choose a fuel model. Somebody pick a fuel model that they want to run. What are we here for? Yeah, we can do Shepard all. Alright, we'll do, we'll do some others obviously. Alright, so we're going to choose fuel model 4. Alright, cool. So what, what changes do you see once I put in fuel model 4? What changes on that input screen here did you see? They open up from, there's no longer blue, they're all no longer. Yeah, see how they're not shaded? Thank you, Sal. See how uh, 1, 10, 100, and live woody moisture is no longer shaded? Let's, uh, let's change that to a different fuel model. Let's go to 9. Okay, now 1, 10, and 100 is no longer shaded, but live herbaceous moisture and live woody moisture is now shaded. Uh, anybody that knows fuel models well enough want to say you know the difference between fuel model 4 and fuel model 9 and why, why there might be a difference there? And this goes back to understanding fuel models and one's, how they work. One's brush and one's timber? Yeah, so 4 is brush, right Cindy? Mm -hmm. And so because it's brush, it's going to have a herbaceous, well it's going to have a live woody moisture, but fuel model 4 does not have a herbaceous associated with it, right? So it has a live woody. So like, remember how you guys take live woody fuel moisture percentages? You know, like the, the percentage of fuel moisture for the chaparral. Like, like you see that reported? Like a fuel stick is that? Yeah. What, that's what a woody is. What the woody? No. Well, the fuel stick is the ten hour fuel. Uh, kiln. Yeah, but when you guys go out and do oh, the new okay. and the oh, old fuel group, samples, yeah. Yeah, the actual fuel <laughs> samples. They're usually like in the well, sixty is critical. Yeah. Right. It goes up to 80, 90, 100. So what's a herbaceous? What is that technically? Herbaceous would be if you have uh, well grass okay. or forbs or anything like that. It's okay. much more. It's the smaller scale stuff. It's okay. not woody. So if you think of woody, you know, I don't know how to say this, but woody is like wood. You know, like the the stems of uh -huh. chaparral. Okay. Uh, the technical definition would be lignified, which means so like a. You guys all know the difference between like a piece of wood and a piece of grass. A grass is not lignified. It hasn't turned to wood. Uh, so anything that hasn't turned to wood is be would be in the herbaceous category. Chaparral, at least the way chaparral is modeled, as an input to fire behavior, herbaceous does not affect it, but the live woody moisture does. So if we change that back to fuel model nine, which is long needle or hardwood litter, when I think of fuel model nine, I think of the, uh, the oak litter that I started my career with back in Illinois. If you guys ever burned back east? Uh, it's that it's that litter layer. There's absolutely no herbaceous moisture, or there's no herbaceous species, or or woody species, or herbaceous or brush species, basically that are driving it. So that's not considered herbaceous, even though it's like it's not similar to grass. It's the uh, it's the primary carrier of the fire. Uh -huh. So when you choose a fuel model, you're always looking for what's called the primary carrier of the fire, and that's an important concept to keep in mind. The only thing you're modeling is the main thing that the fire is burning in. So, for instance, in a nice oak, woody forest floor, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of grass. Yeah, there's going to be some shrubs and that sort of thing. If you took away everything except for that grass and the shrubs up there, would you have a fire or ability to carry a fire across? Probably not, right? It wouldn't be continuous enough. You need all that oak litter and litter layer in between it to really drive that fire. That's the fuel model. Does everyone follow that? So that's how you choose it. And that is why in a fuel model 9, which is like an understory timber stand, there's no herbaceous moisture and woody moisture. So those are the difference that, like I was saying, you need to look at those and, and kind of get an idea. <coughs> so then, of course, you have below that, you have, um, well, let's go back to Chaparral because you guys wanted to do that. That's cool. So one, one hour moisture, let's see. What, and so one, ten, hundred, and thousand, those are what kind of fuel moisture? Do you remember? 
Are you? Is that live fuel or dead fuel? Dead fuel. Yeah. It's all dead fuel, right? Because remember from 190 and 290 classes that you've taken, one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, those are the drying times or the waiting times of a dead piece of fuel. That's why you have that 10 hour, the fuel stick. That's your, it's, it's dead fuel versus live for basis of live woody. So the range of a one hour fuel, anybody know what the range is? Like the input range for a one hour fuel is probably going to be? Is it going to be as high as 100? No. Oh wait, yeah, it's the same. Yeah, okay, yeah. So for all the time lag fuels, it's going to be 1 to 60. But in reality, if you get above 30, that's pretty much as, it's, it really starts to model as, like, it's not going to burn. For instance, the, uh, the moisture of extinction for a piece of grass is about 13%. So if we do, a, like, a fuel model 1, which is all grass in this, and we put, like, 15%, one hour moisture on here, it's not going to show any fire because it's not going to be burning. These are the sort of things. We'll, we'll put it all together, don't worry. I don't want to lose you guys on here. Um, I'll show you plenty of examples that look like that. But so you need to understand the limitations of these fuel models is what I'm coming down to. Anyway, so give me, let's do a one hour fuel moisture, four, let's say four, five, and six. That's pretty common for a burn plan. Uh, what would be a live woody moisture of Chaparral, like, I don't know, right now? You guys know? What's it sitting at right now? 70 ish. 70 ish. I can't do ish, so I'll just put 70. <laughs> and then uh, let's do, say, a 5 foot, 5 mile per hour mid, mid flame wind speed. Let's say the slope is about 15. So this is the most basic run that you can make. And this is just going to give you um, a surface, a surface fire. It's going to model a surface fire in this fuel bed. And actually, it shows that right here. It inputs a surface. And so if you want to run a run, and believe me, we're going to go into much more detail, don't worry. But if you want to run this run, you go to this button here. See this little guy here? It looks like a, a calculator, I think, maybe it's supposed to be. See how it says calculate this run? Everybody see that tab? Okay. There's two very important tabs on this. There's this one, which is module selection, which we're going to spend a lot of time in. And then there's this one that's calculate this run. So you can't just press enter, you can't just say go or whatever. You have to go up here and press this button. And it does its magic and it gives you an output. So you've run your first run here. And it tells you two things. The default is the surface rate of spread, which is a, in, always in chains per hour. So it gives you 110 chains an hour, which is a little over a mile an hour. And flame length, so 24.6 feet. So based upon this model, and see these arrows right here, see these up and down, double up and down, uh, up and down. If you do uh, the double up and down and the double down, it's um, it goes all the way to the first and all the way to the last, and then the f these single arrows just scroll one at a time. Because this is the most simple run, there's actually only two pages. There's the input page in the beginning, and then there's your your output page. And see how where I did the uh, the description here, pre work problem one, the uh, in the description in the beginning, right here, it shows up on your outputs so that if you were to print these outputs, you would know where it came from. Anybody cool with that? So th again, uh, this is your most basic run. Everybody see how to get to that point? Mm -hmm. All right, so from here, it just gets more complicated, <laughs> basically. You guys ready? I mean, you guys can walk away right now because you know everything there is to know about behave. That's the, that's the most basic part. So if you guys want to keep going, we'll keep going. OK, so let's go into the module selections part. See this little button with the, uh, the three little uh, blue squares and the lines. Click on that. Everybody get there. The fans are running them hot. It's not cold. Cool. So these are <coughs> your input modules. It defaults when you first put it on uh, to surface fire spread. And you see how these, you have a, uh, you have a tiering actually, it isn't apparent, but you have a tiering where you have surface fire spread and pig are all the way on the left. Think of it as like paragraphs and indents where the ones that are below it kind of like these most directly tier to the surface fire spread and then this fire containment is tiered to the size of a point source fire. So these are all modules that you can select or deselect. So if I deselect this surface fire spread model and I click OK, there's nothing that you can do on the input page because there's no inputs to be had. See? So you can't do anything. I can go back to the 
module selection page and I can click, I don't know, spotting distance or something. And I come on here and it brings up all the inputs for the spotting, uh, spotting distance uh, module. And see how it says input here? Spot. So it, it uses a lot of abbreviations or semi-abbreviations. So spot is the spotting module. And then it has all kinds of these things. And we're going to go through all of these because that's what you need to know. But uh, so see how it says options next to all these modules? Okay, this is where this is something that when you're going to first set up behavior run and you're wanting to get to an output, again, you kind of need to know where you're going. You kind of need to know what your outputs are going to be. And you also need to know what your inputs are. So this is, I like to think of this as sort of like the master input selection screen. Now I'm going to put surface back on here and then I'm going to press options. And then what this brings up is a whole other group of uh, tabs and stuff that you have to go through. Now surface is by far the scariest one, it has a, the most tabs to go in, but most of the things that are on here, the defaults will get you where you need to go. So you can pretty much just do the defaults. It's when you want to start changing things and you want to start varying your outputs or varying your inputs that you need to go into these tabs and start making changes. Copy. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of here, or, yeah, actually, let's do this. Let's go through the surface. So the, well, actually, okay, what I wanted to show was that, that t this screen here, when you press the surface options, so there's fuel, moisture, wind speed, direction, all this. Um, so a surface fire is the most important type of fire. You, most of the time, you need a surface fire to support uh, and help, a, say, a crown fire. You know, like you guys have heard of that active crowd fire requires a surface fire. Um, you know, a surface fire is the lowest common denominator. That's why there's all the inputs to surface fire. I think a surface fire is like, you know, the, the base of the pyramid and everything else tears from it. But if you go over to the crown fire options tab, see how there's only three things? There's input options, spread options, and intensity options. So there's not nearly as much things that you need to worry about. And again, we'll come through these. Same thing with, you know, say fire containment. There's actually only two things, input and output. And most of these, um, you know, it's, most of these you can just default to. But that's why you really need to look at all the surface fire output. So the first time you do a behave run, you, uh, you want to go into the surface and you want to make sure that these are where you want them to be. So we're just, a lot of the rest of this class and the rest of this morning is just going to be going through all these tabs and options. But I want to take a step back first and ask if there's any questions about how we got to where we're at, and I'm going to recap it. So any questions at this point about where we're at and how behavior is sort of structured? You know, everybody following? Andrew? Cindy, please. Oh, well, what I was going to say is like, going back to the very beginning, okay. um, you mentioned about having the, you know, the books and the guides here with the your walls in it, but if you could just show people that haven't played with this before, when you go in um, right. to fuel model, and then um, when it brings up the oh yeah, so you click on the arrow right there, and then go over yeah. to the fuel model. And if you're not familiar or you're really trying to decide what fuel model you want, you're like, okay, yo, what's fuel model four? And then you click on the fuel model four chaparral blue down. Yes. Thank you, and Cindy. And it will bring it up so you can actually go through and... Um, Sorry, my screen's off. Yeah, there we go. Yep. And you can look through each with pictures of the field. Mm -hmm. It's all right there for you. Yes, thank you. that's an excellent point. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Cindy. You're right. The books, the fuel model books are actually in Behave right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, the are the Scott Anderson ones? Yeah. It should have some descriptions as well, too, right? Well, it has the 13, or it doesn't have the other one, does it? I, yeah, it's fancy. So let's check it out. So fuel model, this is a description of a fuel model. Yeah, th these are the two books, by the way. Hal Anderson, Aids to Determining Fuel Models for Estimating Fire Behavior. That's the 13, and then the Scott and Bergen book is the standard 40. But, yeah, that's right. I don't think it actually has the description of the 40 in here. 
There's some other ones. That's I guess that's a shortcoming, but it does have the 13, so that's good. And I have a question. It sure is. Which for the fuel models, you have the 13, you have the, the 40. Which is the preferred ones to to use? You know, that question comes up a lot, and it's there's no sort of like national standard. We have no national direction or anything. But the 40 were built because the 13 weren't really good enough, per se. And the 40, as you really get to know them, they provide you a lot more flexibility and a lot more options. So most people would tell you that getting to know the 40 is what you should do. So I would really get to know the 40. It's, it's in the same basic categories, which grass, brush, timber, and slash. So it has those same. It's just there's more options within them. And, uh, yeah, so I would say you start to get to know the 40. Uh, no, not too many people really using the 13 too much. You'll see some old fire behavior analysts and stuff that are still hanging on to it, but most of the people that are doing the new modeling and all the new stuff is using the 40. And there's actually more that they're working on too. Uh, so it's going to be more than 40 eventually. Actually, well, there's actually are other ones, but they're not standardized yet. These are the standardized ones that are across the nation. And you can make your own custom fuel model. You can, yeah. You can make your own. We can show you how to do that too, which is cool. And you can also weight, you can take like two fuel models and weight them together across an area, which actually I think one of the, the Scanzo burn plans actually did. So in the vein of what Cindy brought up is that a lot of the, in fact, pretty much all of these have a, I, a, yeah, thank you so much for bringing this up. I totally with that. Have a description of what it is. So if you don't know what the heck live woody moisture is, mm -hmm. it has a definition right here. It has what the inputs are and kind of some general descriptions of like what happens if you use it. Um, some more than others, but it's like for instance, it gives you this. You guys have probably seen this in uh, like S290 before, where it talks about 30 is completely cured, 30 percent live fuel moisture is completely cured, 50 is entering dormancy, 100 is mature foliage up to, and it goes all the way up to 300 percent. And at, technically, it could be more than 300 percent. It just rarely ever gets that high. Uh, it's, it's all a ratio, so it's not bound by 100. Uh, 100 percent fuel moisture does not mean that it's 100 percent full. It means that it's a one-to-one -one ratio, which means literally only that there's as much water weight in the plant as there is dry weight in the plant. And that's why it can be more than 100, because the water weight in a plant can actually be more than the dry weight of the plant. You know, it makes sense? Yeah, that's why it goes up to 300. If you guys have never heard that before. Somewhere? Yes. So going down to the 40, mm -hmm. uh, so some have in parentheses D and S, is D dead and S is nope. dynamic. Nope, D is dynamic, dynamic and S is static. And what that means is, we can get into a whole discussion with this, but uh, you remember, oh, you should know this, we, we lectured on this. Remember how as you go from, the, remember that thing I just had, which was at 30 to 300 uh, percent? Let's see if I can find that again. Shit, where was that? Oh, it was in the life of the watcher, that's right. Let me bring this up. So what happens is in a dynamic model, as you input, <coughs> as you even if it is so if it's in the live fuel moisture category, so it's in the live herbaceous. If you put 30% in for the live herbaceous fuel moisture, it's going to treat it as a dead fuel. So it's basically the same as a dead fuel. But as you increase that to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 it's going to slowly treat it more as a live fuel it's going to recognize that plants through time uh, you know green up and then die off and shrubs especially as we know our chaparral gains water loses water with time and what dynamic fuel modeling allows us to do is model that change through time a static fuel model, it's the same fuel moisture the whole time. Like, it, it doesn't, or, well, you can change the fuel moisture, but it, it either burns or doesn't. It's very static. Or dynamic, it'll go. And what, and what you'll see, what the outputs will be, let's say that same brush at 60% fuel moisture, if you model it as such, it'll rip, you know, it'll burn really, really well. It'll say, let's say, for instance, it has 100 chains per hour. But if you change that to, say, 100, that 100 chains per hour that you had before, it'll model it down at say 30 chains an hour. 
in effect, what it'll show is the fire behavior metrics, the actual fire behavior outputs, will be reduced the wetter the plant gets. And we all know that that's how nature works, right? Now, it's a model, so it's not perfect, but it at least seeks to, it at least seeks to uh, replicate that transition through a plant's life stage, where as a plant goes and gets closer to flowering, it becomes less available. You can use this in prescribed fire, and this is why the 40s are better for prescribed fire because we burn a lot of times when plants are actually in their growing phases. For instance, a lot of our fuel break burns, we, we model the adjacent fuel moisture as higher because it will be maybe 75, 80, 85 percent when we're burning our fuel breaks. And because of that, as we know, that those fuels a lot of times adjacent to our fuel break burning will act as a barrier. You guys seen that before, you know? We, throw some fire up against it and it'll more or less bounce off, um, especially the higher it gets. So this is how in a prescribed fire burn plan you can uh, use that dynamic modeling. Versus right. like if you're burning like mastication or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like if you had a burn plan you're burning mastication, you would use your fuel model for the mastication it's would be static. like a dead, yeah, like a dead, like a 10 hour fuel bed. I think we use like slash blowdown 2, which is a, entirely a slash fuel model. Mm -hmm. And then adjacent to it, we'll model that, that, um, that live brush. And so it will show that, yes, it will burn in the fuel bed, but no, it won't burn adjacent to it. Or at least it won't burn very well. It will burn to a point where we can suppress it for the most part. And we've seen that. Do you guys agree? All right. Is anybody completely lost or do we need to spring back on something? I don't want to lose you on this fuel model and stuff. Good? Seriously, let me know. I, I want. I'll, I'll, I'll just take another minute and explain it. It's cool. All right. Those are some great questions because this is sort of the underpinning, really, like fuel model selection, fuel moisture inputs. It really is the underpinnings of of getting the proper outputs to it. And you have to understand. You have to relate it back to what the plant is doing in time. Cool. There we go. All right. Uh, so again, the point I wanted to make with this, uh, going back to what Cindy brought up, is that if you have any questions about any of this stuff, there are there are nice little help files right next to it. And uh, let's do another one. Like let's say this one, and I think there's an explanation of what in the world is ridge to valley elevational difference. Like I mean, how many times do we come across that term? So it'll actually say, you know, this is what it is. It, ridge to valley elevational difference is the vertical elevation and difference in feet between a ridge top and a valley bottom. Oh, okay, that makes a little more sense. It's the ridge to valley elevational difference. And uh, a lot of times there's even little pictures to show you that, you see this arrow right here? So from the valley bottom here to the ridge top here, whatever that height is, that's the ridge to valley elevational difference. So I, again, I did a lot of this when I was first learning to behave, uh, as I looked at a lot of these pictures and I looked at the manuals and that sort of thing. Go ahead, Jose. Thank you. Okay, let's go back through that. So, remember these little arrows here? Yeah. These basically think of these arrows as there's two things these arrows give you. One is the input, so that you can understand how to input. You can input it directly, like say, ridge to valley elevational. I just know it's a thousand feet. A thousand feet. Okay, cool. Or you can go into this arrow. It'll tell you what the limits are: zero to four thousand feet. So there can only be zero to four thousand. That's the maximum. You can't have a 5,000 foot elevational difference. Hey, we're, we're calculus, we're, uh, what is that in? Is that spot? What selection mod is like? Oh, okay, that's a good. Question. Yeah, I'm sorry, guys. I wasn't really using this as an example, but it happens to be the spotting right, distance. Spotting. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go through all these, and we're going to explain all these terms. It's going to get pretty <laughs> tedious after a while, but for the record, that's where we're at. Yeah. So then what you do is, again, you press a little arrow here, and it brings up two things. One, the inputs, and it tells you how you can input it. And then over to the right of it, always, is the default, is the explanation of that input variable. So if you ever have a question, it's all right there. If you have a question after that, then you, you, know, you ask somebody or whatever. It's pretty handy. I mean, this is an extremely user-friendly program. They really, it's pretty well thought out. It's pretty simple inputs. Um, I might as well show you this since we're here. See how it says from, through, and step? So you can do 0 to 4,000. You can actually do multiples. So 
It doesn't make a lot of sense for there to be multiple <coughs> ridge to valley elevational differences. So let's let's say we'll go up to this torching tree height. That's just the height of the trees that are torching. This is part of the spot fire module. So you can have from 10 to 300 foot tall trees. So I'm going to put from 10 through, let's say the maximum is a 100 foot tall tree, and then the step is 10 foot. So anybody want to hazard a guess at what this is going to look like on my input screen? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Anybody follow that? Yeah. Starts at 10, goes to 100, stepwise through by 10. So yeah, exactly what Sarah said, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way through. So it's modeling 10 different tree heights as potential spot fire sources. Okay, and you can do that for all of these. The only caveat is you can only do two variables, I think it's two variables that have multiples. So you can't do like, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna go back to the module selection screen. I'm gonna get rid of spotting distance because that's kind of complicated and we haven't talked about it yet. So I'm gonna go back to just the basic surface, okay? And I'm going to do, so I want to, I want to model live woody moisture, right? So the, the <coughs> moisture in the brush over time. So I'm going to start at 50%, which is below critical, pretty hot. And then I'm going to model 60, which is critical. And then I'm going to model 70, and then I'm going to model 80, and let's say 90 after that. So that's five different fuel moistures. Let's say maybe that's five different months out of the year that you can model. Um, and then I also want to model different wind speeds. I'm going to say I want to model five, seven, whoops, all right. I'll go back to 15 for the slope. Five, seven, 10, 15. So that's different fuel moistures and different wind speeds. Everybody see how those differences are? So and then I'm going to run it. How do we run it again? We go back up to the, hopefully the fan isn't blocking <laughs> too much. And so I'm going to calculate this run. Pretty much always ignore this screen that comes up when you have doubles. It's really just asking you how you want the table results to look like, and you can modify which one you want on the x-axis and which you want on the, the y-axis. I always pretty much just press OK. Sometimes there'll be differences. And then what this results in is it gives you a table, a multi-row, multi-column table, and it and this is pretty cool because it shows you 50 at 50% live woody moisture. And at five mile per hour, it gives you 137 chains per hour. Okay, same fuel moisture regime 50. At seven, gives you 215 chains an hour, and then 349 chains an hour. So obviously, we know the windier it gets, the higher the rate of spread. And then you can look at that. Okay, well that's cool, but what if it was down at 90 percent, or yeah, 90 percent live woody moisture, five, seven. So you see that difference, in, and the difference here is the fuel moisture you're putting in and the wind speed. So you can do that two ways, but let's say, oh crap, wrong, wrong button. I'm going to double arrow up here up to the top. So I want to do multiple wind, wind speeds, multiple moistures. Let's say I want to do multiple hundred hour moistures as well. Six, eight, oh, ten, twelve. By the way, when you do multiples, multiple variables in the inputs. You can either put a space between them or you can do a column. Either way works. So this has three way variable. Well, you can't do more than two range of variables because they haven't figured that would be like a 3D table. It would have to try to spit out. You can only do a 2D table, an X and a Y axis. So you only have two range of variables because it only, only do an X and a Y axis in that table. So you can only do two. It's a limitation of the program, but it's really not that big of a deal. Because if you're getting that complex with all those things, just do another run. If you need to really look across different variables, just set up another run. For instance, if I really wanted to look at one in 100 moistures, you know, I just get it and choose one live weight moisture. Okay, is everyone following me so far? We're getting a little tangential here, but it's interesting. It's good to look at the, uh, at the inputs. So, all right, let's go back to the module selection. And let's go back to surface fire spread options. And remember, these are the options specific to this input module, which is surface, their surface crown, safety, safety zone, size, contain. We'll look at all these. So for the surface, it gives you options. And we'll start all the way on the left here. And you got choices. Choices are good in life. The first.
first. Uh, by the way, did the uh, did everybody get a chance to sign the roster? Who didn't get to sign the roster? All right, let's get that back up here. Right? Make sure everybody gets credit for this. So for the fuel, uh, the tab on the left all the way for fuel, this is mostly talking about the fuel moistures. So it gives you some options, okay? It says fuel is entered as, how do you want to describe the fuel models? Your first option, which is the default option, is just a standard or a custom fuel model. Um, you can do the fuel parameters, which lets you literally enter in all the various parameters that go into a fuel model. I'll show you real quick that look, what that looks like. What you do is you click the radio button, you go back to OK, OK, and then it brings up all this stuff. So if you actually want to know what goes into a fuel model, what all the numbers are, you can look at it. It gives you the one hour, 10, 100 uh, fuel loads and tons per acre. It gives you the surface area to volume ratio, which is um, you know, live herbaceous, live weight, all this fuel bed depth, dead fuel moisture of extinction. These are all the things that go into the model, sort of like the algorithm. Now there are, you can actually change these if you feel like you know what these numbers are. And there are actually some custom fuel models that are available in papers, and scientific papers that I've used. There's actually, some, there's, a, there's a, about eight Southern California chaparral fuel models that are in this paper that you can go in and, and what that paper does is it provides every single one of these variables. And so you just go in and you input those into it and then you're using one of those custom fuel models. Most of the time you have to go and do like a very rigorous scientific analysis in order to come up with like what the live woody surface area to volume ratio is and stuff. So that's why most of the time we just use the uh, default. And you can actually initialize it from a fuel model if you want to and start changing. But Anyway, so I'm going to go back to the module selection, surface fire options, fuel. Uh, and then you get into all this other stuff. Uh, I've never really used any of these except for, well, I've actually, okay. Well, I've used two fuel models. So this is you take two fuel models and you area weight it. And this is actually kind of a cool little thing. It's not too hard to use. And what that means is if you think that there's two fuel models out there or there's like a transition, for instance, maybe, maybe you're using... Um, one of the new shrub models and it's not quite shrub three and it's not quite shrub four. Well maybe you go in and you put shrub four, shrub three and shrub four and you do like 50-50. I think is how it looks. I haven't done this in a while, so let's click on it. So I click that radio button, it says two fuel models, area weighted, like old behave. Um, so first so it gives you a first fuel model, so you put shrub two and then second fuel model, shrub three, and then uh, it gives you the first fuel model coverage and what that means is for the first fuel model, how much of it is covering the area. And the reason you don't need to uh, do second fuel model coverage is because obviously it just subtracts it, right? So you might say 50%. So 50% of the area is, is, is represented by shrub two, 50% is by shrub three. Um, this is not a hard thing to do. And if you really start picking apart the fuel models, a lot of times you'll see stuff like that. Um, for instance, on our fuel breaks, you might have you know how the, we have Lop and Scatter, um, and that's you know a, a, like a, a, a slash fuel model. But we also have kind of areas that are a little grassy. So you could totally do like maybe it's like a slash slow down two, and maybe like a grass, you know, like a grass two. And that kind of it gives you an average. Remember, this is a model. Like no one's ever gonna like look at your outputs and go measure the flame lengths and say, did you you know did you get it close? You just want to give something close. Whenever you're doing this, you just want to give give the burn plan, you know, the burn plan writer wants to give what is a representation of the kind of fire behavior that we're anticipating out there. That's the only purpose of this. It's never going to be perfectly accurate. It just wants to get you in the ballpark. So, anyway, everybody follow that? Yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not super hard. And if you do stuff like this, you look so cool as a burn plan writer. Yeah, everybody would be super impressed. It's not even that hard. All right. So fuel, and then uh, if you ever get into like palmetto gallberry or whatever, and I've actually used this one, which is a special case fuel model, it's for a Western Aspen. There's this paper that came out, uh, Brown Zimmerman in 86 wrote it. I used this one when we were doing Aspen restoration, and it lets you model uh, fire behavior in Aspen, because uh, there's no good fuel model for it. So, but most of the time you're either going to use this fuel model, standard, or do area weighted. So this is just options that you have. So you need to go in here and decide what you want to do. And if you want to change it, this is where you change it. Cool?
Thumbs up? Alright. Cool. Next one over is moisture. This is obviously referring to the <coughs> fuel moisture, not like rain coming down. It's the fuel moisture. And it gives you two options here. One is dynamic curing load transfer. It's calculated from live herbaceous fuel moisture or input directly. Okay. So remember that whole concept we talked about where if you use a D model, a dynamic model, where as you increase the moisture in it, it models it differently, where you go from 30% to 50% to 60 to 80, it'll lower the rate of spread and it'll lower the flame length. So the default is it's calculated from the live herbaceous fuel moisture, which simply means it looks at the live herbaceous fuel moisture and depending on what that number is, it's going to change the flame length. Or you can override that, or it's going to change the fire behavior outputs. Or you can override that and you could input it directly where, and the only reason you would do that is if you don't like what the output is. If you, if, if you think that despite the increase in moisture, that's the fuel, and despite the increase in the fuel moisture, or despite the decrease in the fuel moisture, you, you know, you don't like what, you think it's actually higher flame length or a lower flame length, you can actually change that. So let's look at, I'm a visual person, let's see what it looks like, right? Uh, so if you do calculate it from life, it just does it automatically in the background. But if you do it input directly, and I think I'm actually going to have to change the, I'm going to have to change, so I'm, it's grayed out. Whenever it's grayed out, it means not applicable. It means it's, it's, you can put whatever you want in here, it's not going to listen to you because it's not part of the algorithm. Okay, so how do I, how do I make it relevant? I'm in a fuel model 4. How do I make fuel load transfer portion relevant? Or in other words, not grayed out. Change the fuel model. Change what input? The fuel model. Remember how I said all 13 of the of the fuel models are static models? That means they will they won't do that dynamic load transfer. So we have to go to something that is a a D, right? A dynamic model. So let's go to grass five low load humid climate grass. Bam! See how it popped that up? So fuel load transfer portion, again it, it this is something you probably won't do, but you know I just want to talk about it. I want to expose you guys to this stuff. So say 50%, you know, it'll change it'll change the outputs. Oh that's right, I need the live herbaceous. And we'll put in an 80 for and yeah, put in 80 for live herbaceous. I don't know what it's gonna look like. Again, it does it in the background, but it's just an override. Let's see. I wonder what it would be. So okay, this is how you learn behavior. I'm, I'm standing here and I'm looking at this I'm like, I wonder what it would do. So I put in 50%, right? And I'm like, I wonder what the outputs would be if I went back and changed that setting back to calculate it automatically. You know, I'm wondering what the change would be. Th again, this is how you learn behave. So let's do that. I'm curious. So I'm putting in 50% fuel load transfer portion. Uh, let's get rid of this so it's easier to look at. We'll just put 7 mile per hour wind speed. I'm going to calculate to run. It gives me 67 chains an hour, 11 foot flame length. Remember that, 67 and 11. All right. So what do I need to do to go back? Module selection. So I'll go back to module selection, go back to surface fire spread, go back to moisture, and do calculated from live herbaceous fuel moisture. Press OK, press OK, go back and run it again. So, okay, 61 chains an hour and 11. So and 10.9. It didn't really change it much, but it, you know, this is where, like, if, if I didn't like those outputs the first time, I'd be like, that's too much. I'm going to go and I'm going to change this directly. What is that specifically a measure of? That 50? Like, where do you pull that number? It, from? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it would be, okay, what it is, is it's the percent of the piece of fuel that it is modeling as dead. Oh, okay. So 50% dead. 50% live. live. Okay. In this case, because our our run was, so what was our run? It was a lower flame length, right? And it was a lower rate of spread. So what was it doing in the background made it more, to the piece of fuel? More wet. It made it wetter. And so when we changed it to 50, what did we do? Took more 
moisture out. Yeah, we took the moisture out. We, we, we transferred more of the fuel to the dead category. So what, in essence, what we said was we didn't like what it did. We want to make more of it dead. So I would guess that the automatic one was maybe more in like the 40, 45% transfer. But I said I want it to be 50% transferred to dead. Therefore, I get higher outputs. Okay, you guys good? All right. Cool. Makes sense? This is just, like I said, this is how you mess around with behave. It's not super hard. It's just going in, making changes, playing around with it. It's kind of fun. At, well, I don't know. If you're like me, it's kind of fun after a while. Just gotta see what the differences are. Okay, anyway, going back to surface. So we're at moisture. Steven? Yes? If you did that where you manually inputted it, would you adapt the note that in the note section or whatever on the run that you. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Absolutely, absolutely would do that, either in the notes in the bottom of the behavior run or more appropriately for a burn plan. Uh, what I would like to see as a technical reviewer is in the, there's a, uh, there's like a summary in element uh, four and element seven, either one of those you can put it into. In the area where you're doing your behavior runs and you're putting in your prescription parameters and your outputs, I would absolutely put that in the narrative. And I would be so blown away and impressed if you guys did something like that. I'd be like, man, you guys are really looking at the models, really, really trying to apply it. Um, that's some high-level stuff, you know. Really getting to know these models and applying it to what you're actually seeing around the ground. Because all you guys have been burning for years and years, right? You know what this stuff looks like. You, this is just a model. There's enough flexibility in this model that you really can uh, modify it to meet your needs and to meet the actual um, outputs that you see on the ground. Especially like, you know, based upon when we're actually burning, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I encourage you to do so. Cool. Yeah, that was a good question. Definitely if you make changes like that that are off the default, I would definitely uh, narr uh, I would definitely narrate it in the thing. And the other thing is that, so for the record, if you get into burn plant writing on the Cleveland here and I'm in my same position, I, I do all the technical reviews and what I do is I run all the runs and I verify the outputs and that sort of thing. and. Um, you know, I want to see all those inputs and those changes and stuff, just to verify it. Okay, and then, so you could do moisture is entered by the individual size classes, or you could do it by dead and live category or, or a moisture scenario. Uh, those are just three different um, sort of categories. The individual size classes just means the 1, 10, and 100. Uh, you know, those time lag fuel size classes we've been seeing forever. 1, 10, and 100, remember those? Yeah, so that's what individual size classes means. And then I think the dead and life category is, I think you input, let's click on that. I think it, it, you get to choose how much is dead and how much is alive. Yeah, that's what I thought. So if you change that moisture scenario, it's kind of like almost another way of doing that. Like you need a dynamic model probably for this to work. Actually, okay, so I'm, not, I'm curious if you, if you put in a static model, if this will gray those out. So let's do that. Oh, that's interesting. So if I put in I put in uh, fuel model three, which is tall grass, all of a sudden there's no live fuel moisture input, but there is a dead fuel moisture input because fuel model three is all dead, right? So you can put how much of it is going to be modeled as dead, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of an interesting. It's kind of funky. But anyway, that's what that looks like. Is you can put in a, a percentage of dead and a percentage of live. See? See what I'm saying? Okay. So back to the moisture, and then there's a moisture scenario. To be honest with you, I can't remember what this looks like, so let's see what it looks like. Moisture scenario. Okay, so it gives me that blue arrow, and I have no idea. You guys want to take an adventure here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, let's see. There it is. Oh, my God. What is this? Oh, this is pretty cool. Pass. What's that? Pass. Pass. <laughs> So I don't know what it means, so I'm going to come over here on the right and I'm going to say it's a fuel moisture scenario is a set of fuel moistures values representing moisture conditions on the surface fuels. One ten hundred live. Uh, it's analogous to a fuel model. They package as a number of parameters into a labeled set. So it looks like it's a kind of like a category. It's kind of like a scenario. So DLL1 is low dead fully cured herb. So what is, what did I click? Low, so there's not a lot of dead, and there's a lot of really fully cured herbs. What do you think that would look like fire behavior-wise, to have low dead component and fully cured herbs? 
fuels. Light flashy fuels, yeah. Probably would burn all right, but not a lot of dead component. I don't know. So it's just like a scenario. And then there's high dead, high dead, fully cured herb. I don't know, just weird stuff. That's actually could be pretty cool, pretty cool. Are those numbers on the right? Did you say that? Are those the, the one hour, the ten hour? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. So what that this thing sell? That's what I'm thinking. This is is six for the one, six percent for the one hour fuel, seven percent for the ten, eight four hundred, and then nine is going to be uh, what's first? I think You're live herbaceous. Live herbaceous, and then one twenty is going to be live woody. So that's the actual numbers that go into it. Yeah, that's pretty, pretty neat actually. So there's some differences. Obviously this is a wetter scenario, and then these are drier scenarios at the top, across those ranges. Cool. Okay, so that's your moisture inputs. Again, most people, the default is calculated, the dynamic curing load transfer is calculated, and the individual size classes. We're used to seeing that. There's a reason these are the defaults, and the reason is because that's the way we're taught in like our 190, 290, 390 classes. That's what it looks like. Questions at this point? So then, wind speed. This is, this isn't, uh, actually, yeah. So wind speed and directions, these are the two that screw people up the most. And like even to this day, I'm like, I, I'm not an expert in behave by any means. I'm not trying to be, but I, I still have to like really think about this. So there's a couple different things here. The first one is wind speed is entered as mid flame height. We're all familiar with mid flame height, right? So right at eye level, that's the same as the eye level winds for the most part. That's the default. That's where your wind speed is entered. Uh, what is the wind speed that we get from the National Weather Service most of the time? On spots, yeah. Unless you specify, you're getting 20 foots. Um, so that's something that can be kind of a misnomer um, when you're looking at your spots and stuff and burning. So there's different ways that you can input this in. The first is 20 foot, 20 foot, uh, and then it's 10 meter, 10 meter. So we're not in uh, Europe or whatever, so we're going to stick with the feet. Uh, and then you have 20 foot wind and an inputted wind adjustment factor. And then there's 20 foot wind and a calculated wind adjustment factor. Whenever it says calculated and behave, all right, here's an asterisk. Whenever it says calculated, it means behave will do the calculation for you based upon an input that you've made. Okay, so it will do the numbers for you, but you have to provide it some, some basis for knowing how to make that calculation. Or whenever it says like input, that means it's going to rely on you to be the expert and put an input on there. Uh, you guys should be, again, you guys should be familiar with this from like the 290 classes uh, where you have the, uh, um, what do they call it? I don't know if they call it the wind adjustment factor. What do they, they call do. it? Is it it's called the wind that? adjustment factor. It's by 0.3. It's based yeah. on canopy coverage. Yeah, it's the, it's the percentage of coverage. I'll, I'll show you. 0.3, 0.4, or 0.2. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep, yep. So let's, let's switch it. So mid flame wind height, that's an easy one, but we'll switch it to 20 foot and input. Wind adjustment factor, and for instance, if you wanted to be able to see what it looks like if they give you the 20 foot winds. So, yeah, and this, I'm going to click up this blue arrow on the wind adjustment factor. Like Sarah was saying, it goes from 0.1 to 1. It is in, in the appendix B, thank you. And you guys maybe have seen this before, where it's from 0 to 1, and depending on the coverage of the canopy, um, this is, you guys ever seen this graph before? Some of you probably have where you have uh, partially sheltered fuels to unsheltered to fully uh, sheltered and then partially sheltered depending on the wind slope and then these are your this is all in, it's, I think this is in the IRPG and it's also in that Appendix P, the Fire Behavior Book so what you have is your your, your wind adjustment factor here for unsheltered fuels would be 0.5 and then it's pretty cool over on this side it gives you some fuel models that are uh, pretty common to have that wind adjustment factor. So for instance, if we were still using fuel model four right here, good rule of thumb if you want to do the input would be a 0.5, right? So that's going to reduce the 20 foot wind speeds by half is what it's going to do. So it's going to take a, a 30 foot wind and it's going to bring it down to 15 miles per hour. Um, to, and you have 0.4, which you can, you do see some overlap sometimes with these, so you just have to make a judgment call. Uh, the timber ones, 
the higher the canopy you're, is the lower the number because it's going to take because I don't want to do math it's going to take a 10 on a 0.3 wind adjustment factor it's going to take a 10 mile per hour wind and it's going to bring it down to 3 mile per hour so that's a lot of energy that's getting sucked off the 20 foot winds it's because you have all those tall trees that are blocking it you know what I'm saying so timber understory 4 timber understory 4 timber litter those are all the timber models and 8 and 9 are the timber models and then you have partially sheltered fully sheltered uh, so you can go all the way from like an extremely dense stand. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. You, you get into like a re, like a really dog hair thicket. It's kind of windy outside of that, but you get into that dog hair thicket and there's barely any wind at all. Have you ever experienced that? L little did you know you were in a 0.1 wind adjustment factor area. <laughs> so th that's how that works. I actually like to use this when I do my modeling for behave. Um, because there's other things that can be, that are involved with it. So. Everyone cool with that? Cool with that? So if, if it's a, uh, I think, <coughs> what was the default? Did we put it on calculated or input? Input. input. Okay. And then, so then you can do 20 foot wind and calculated wind adjustment factor. Anybody uh, have any idea what it's going to use to calculate the wind adjustment factor? The fuel model? Yeah, the, yeah, it's going to be the fuel model, and it's also going to be something else, if I, if I recall. Yeah, it's going to be, so I'm going to put this in a, in a fuel model, I'm going to say timber litter three or whatever. Yeah, that doesn't work. All right, let's try, let's try a good old nine. What does that bring up? Let's put a 15 mile per hour wind. Well, it's, okay, it's asking for the canopy cover percent. I'm, I was expecting it to give me canopy height and crown ratio. I wonder why it's not. This is what you put in for your model. Yeah. Hmm. Is this where you play around? Well, whatever. Canopy cover percent. Well, put in the cover the next two bubbles. Oh, do they? Oh, thanks, Derek. Appreciate that. Way to forge ahead, tip of the spear. <laughs> okay, yeah, perfect. All right, so you put in 50% canopy cover. What is a 50% canopy cover going to look like? You know, it's about half the area is covered by the tree crowns. Yeah, I forgot. So that's right. This screws me up every time. Sometimes when you input the first, it'll pop up other things. So then the canopy height. Let's say, the, and that's the height, right? The height of the canopy. Say, I don't know. Let's look at. Okay, I can go from 0 to 300 feet. So I can go all the way from the bottom. I'm going to say the canopy height is, I don't know, 45 feet. And then the crown ratio, this is another one if you don't know what crown ratio is. Uh, crown ratio, there's a handy dandy little picture here. It's the proportion of the crown that, the proportion of the tree that is occupied by the crown. Okay, so a 0.4 would be 40% of the tree, of the stem, is occupied by the crown. 0.6, see how this is 60% of the tree is occupied by the crown on 0.8? So obviously, you know, the closer you get to 1 would, is, is much more of the crown is occupied. And why would this be a factor in the in the wind? Uh, what, why is this relevant to the wind adjustment factor? Yeah, it helps shelter it. The more crown you have, the more blocked the wind is going to be. So we'll put in a, uh, I don't know, we'll put in a point four. And you know, this is another example where, you know, you could put in 40, let's say, okay, 40% is the fraction. Well, that doesn't work. It wants it in, okay, I get it. It wants it in 0.4, so you have to understand the decimals. And then, so what it uses is canopy cover, canopy height, crown ratio, and then it, it will actually calculate the, uh, the wind speed, yeah, which it might. Sometimes it actually gives you the output. But anyway, so it, it calculates that for you. Just different ways to do I mean, so the cool thing about Behave is it gives you, like, for all this stuff, it gives you, like, three, four different ways to do the same thing. It really comes down to how much control you want to have over the inputs, how much control you want to have over the outputs. So the defaults are always the easy one. It just gets a little more complicated from there. All right. Are we good to go till 11 before we take a short break? I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you guys. I, Again, I don't want to lose anybody because you got to keep up with it. Um, all right, and then so then there's this other option which is impose 
It's a question to you. Do you want to impose the maximum reliable effective wind speed limit? And if I recall correctly, what this means is if you press yes, uh, or no, okay, what this is is that, so in the, um, in the Rothermel equations, which are, which are the fire behavior equations that this is running, every fuel model has what's basically an upper limit to how fast the rate is spread, how, fat, how big the flame lengths can get. I think, it's, I think it's mostly the rate of spread. So, for instance, you run it and you reach a certain threshold with your inputs and it just won't burn any faster. It won't model that the fire is burning any faster. For instance, it might get to 150 chains an hour and that is the absolute fastest that that fuel model will run. If you press, and it'll keep it at that, right? So on your graphs, it's almost kind of like a, an upward angle, and then it flattens out. If you press no, that overrides that and it will continue that regression equation. So it'll go past 150, it'll go to 200 chains an hour, go to 300 chains an hour. It'll just keep going. Um, again, why, why do you think you might do something like that? Why would you override the model? Because you know from experience that it could do that. Exactly. That would be the only reason I could think of. Is, like Sarah said, because you know that it goes faster than that. So, the default is to use the maximum reliable effective wind speed limits. Um, yeah, okay. Perfect. And... Actually, this, okay, you know what, this directions is the one that is actually uh, screws people up a lot in, in me. There's, and the, this is one of the most important tabs, this directions one, uh, because how you input stuff in later uh, is directly, I mean, it's all directly dependent upon what your inputs are here, but you really need to know. So there's three things, there's three boxes. The first one is surface fire spread direction is only in the direction of maximum spread or in direction specified on the worksheet. So, you start, when you start uh, getting into, four, when you take 490, at least when I took it, you needed to start actually using this to change the direction when you start doing vectoring, um, which is relevant for the people that are looking at that, but you, you're going to need to know this one because you can actually change the direction that the fire goes based upon the slope and the aspect, um, but the default is that it, in terms of direction, it only models it in the direction of maximum spread. You would want to change this if you're actually trying to model it, like when you're trying to apply this to, to a map or something, where you're like, okay, I want it to go zero degrees, you know, 360 degrees straight north, and then I see that the slope catches it, so I want to start modeling it at, uh, I don't know, 290 degrees, you know, when it starts to be a, a, a southeast facing slope, so you'd have to change that. So anyway, this is why you do that. Then the wind default is always model is upslope. So behave is more or less kind of geared for mountainous terrain, which most of the west is. This is where most people are using this. Um, or you can specify it on the worksheet which way you want the direction to go. And when you have these two components, especially um, surface fire spread direction and wind, when you're specifying that, then you can really start to model terrain. You know, like when you're trying to model the fire behavior and topography. Uh, and the best way to show this is on an example, which I don't have in front of me. Maybe on one of the pre-works we can look at something like that later. Um, but the default you need to remember is, is the wind is always going upslope. Now, if the wind is going, um, if the wind speed is upslope, what kind of fire, more or less, are you always going to model? Hmm? Head fire. It's always going to be a head fire. Yeah, you're always modeling a head fire. And what you can do is you can um, what you can do is if, if you change the direction, say you change the surface fire spread direction. Sorry, I'm trying to knock the rust off here as I talk because it's been a while since I've done this. Um, if you model the surface fire spread direction, say you the surface fire spread direction is uh, straight north zero. And then you change the wind to not be upslope, which would be with it, and you change it to be, say, 90 degrees to it. What it'll, what, how will it model the fire then? The direction is uphill, but the wind is coming at it. Yeah, it's going to let you model a flanking fire. Okay, you guys follow that? Okay, if, if you go with the defaults, it's always going to be a fire burning uphill. 
you can change, you can start to change that, you can start to change the wind inputs. You can even like, you can do surface fire spread direction is uphill, but wind is downhill. You can do completely counter to it. Um, but most of the time what you're doing, like the whole vectoring concept, is you're trying to move, the, you start with a point, and like in the scenarios in 490, again, at least when I took it, was you start at one point and like you have to model that fire like over the course of a mile, so like up and over a hill and up the drainage and that sort of thing. It's not actually that hard to do. You just have to um, make sure you're aware of this, use your compass to get the directions, and you also need to look at the rate of spread over time. So anyway, I don't want to I don't want to throw that at you guys. I don't want to complicate it. So going back to simplified. Um, Again, just be aware. This is one of those awareness things. You need to be aware that the default is always going to be more or less a, a, a head fire. Um, is that always applicable for what we're burning in prescribed fire, in our prescribed fire activities? It's not always, right? Um, every once in a while we might try to actually we might actually try to do a little flanking. Say we do an understory burn. Do you guys ever do any flanking? Fire. I actually don't know. We do some dot firing. We do some different stuff. Um, if you don't want to always try to get this sort of like maximum potential fire behavior, um, then you can you can start making some changes to this. Um, I've done some prescribed fires in the past where we actually tried to do flanking fire, and, and we wanted to try to model it as such because we knew we weren't just going to light a head fire. Because most of the time when we're lighting fire, what are we doing? We're actually doing backing fire. We're trying to get some backing fire, a little bit of head fire. It's actually extremely difficult and kind of a fallacy to think that we can even model prescribed fire because we're, we're always throwing a strip in, right? And that's burning for like a minute and then another strip and then another strip, whatever. Anyway, so behave, and for, and for the record, behave and all these things are really designed for wildfire scenarios. Free burning fire, out on the landscape, not affected by suppression. Okay. And then you can... Um, and this is an important one too. This is the wind and spread directions. This is probably the most confusing tab in all of Behave. Okay, so we'll, we'll hit this and then maybe we'll take five minutes if we need a break. Wind and spread direction are degrees clockwise from upslope or degrees clockwise from north. Okay, this is one of these personal preference that you as a Behave user snore. What I always say is you need to make that decision now what you want to do. It really doesn't matter. Both of these will get you in the same place, but you have to know how you're inputting these, um, and you can you should always do it the same way every time, because um, degrees clockwise from north is a much different input than degrees clockwise from upslope. Okay, and let's see what that. Is. I think we can actually show you what this is. And again, and actually, I should point out this is only relevant if you start to change the defaults up here to upslope wind or surface fire spread direction uh, in direction specified on the worksheet. Again, as you become a more proficient and a more advanced user of Behave, you take those 490 classes and some of those other classes where you actually need to change these spread directions. Um, then how you input the wind and spread directions actually comes up. So let me show you what that looks like. Uh, we'll change surface fire spread direction is, actually I'm going to keep that in the default for now, only in the direction of maximum spread. I'm going to change the wind to specified on the worksheet. And I'm going to do right now the default which is degrees clockwise from upslope. Everybody follow that? So we'll come back and we'll play with this a little bit. We'll go back to surface fire. Uh, let's go back to, let's just do short grass, let's do something simple. Okay, oh, why is canopy? Oh, because of the. Alright, I'm going to go back to options. I'm going to go back to. Uh, sorry, the wind speed, mid flame. I'm, I'm simplifying it right now. I'm going back to the defaults. Okay. You'll notice that in a fuel model one, which is grass, which is just short grass, that's all there is in short grass, you don't have tens, hundreds of the live herbaceous wood. You don't have anything except for the one hour fuel moisture. So this is like the simplest run that you can possibly do. So just imagine a field of grass right now, that's what we're modeling. And I'm going to do a one hour fuel moisture of 5%, so it'll burn, we'll do a mid flame wind speed, we'll just keep it at 7 or whatever you guys want to do. But what's it, what did it pop up here? It popped up a new input, right? You guys see that? Do I need to scroll up? The direction of wind vector, and it clarifies it, from upslope. So 
we haven't seen this before, let's look at a diagram. Let's click on that arrow and see what this looks like. I always have to <laughs> look at this diagram. We go here, talks about which way it is, which way it's pushing, and then there's two, uh, yeah, so this is the direction of the wind vector, the direction the wind is pushing the fire degrees clockwise from upslope. So zero, if you put in zero, okay, that means it's directly upslope. So if you put in zero as the spread direction, that means it's going upslope. But if you put 180, it means it's burning downslope. And then 270 and 90 would be counter to slope. That would be flanking fire. Does that make sense? Everybody follow that? It's, so again, just imagine you have you know, the side of a mountain, and all you want to model is which way is the wind blowing in, in relation to that mountain. Is it going zero, straight up slope? Is that wind actually flowing down over the top of the mountain, which is 180? Is it going 270 or is it going 90? And I think this is the thing that screws people up, which is, yeah, yeah, I, I think this is it. Which is that 270 means it's going 270. Versus like we think of a west wind as coming from 270. Okay, so that's, remember how we always, when we're taught to, you know, a, a west wind means it's west, but it's actually blowing to the east. It's different here. Like 270 means it's going, it's burning to the west. So, you know, th like a thing that could screw you up is if you get a, a story problem in one of your pre-works and it says, there's a, a west wind blowing. Well, do you put 270 or 90 for a west wind? You put 90 for a west wind. Yeah, see, I'm already, I'm like, uh. And so a west wind would actually be going that way, right? This is where people get, like a lot of times in pre-works, I'll see it's, it's, the exact opposite of what it should be because because of this little factor. Okay, is everybody clear on this one? Uh, this little uh, this little diagram is probably my favorite diagram in all of Behave because <laughs> I'm always going in and looking at it and always making sure when I'm running the run. And if for some reason you get the wrong answer, it comes up wonky. Then go back and look at this tab and make sure make sure that um, you've done it correctly. Everybody cool on that? So it really doesn't matter what we put in right now. Let's say, let's, you know what, I'm going to do a double. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to put in direction of wind vector from upslope. I'm going to do zero, right? So that is head fire straight up. What the hell did I do? <laughs> straight up slope, and then I'm going to do 180, which is down slope. Down slope. Cool. And we'll do 270, which is... Flanking fire. Now you tell me what's the fire behavior output's going to look like across these three. Come on, speak up, somebody. Well, yeah, it's going to throw. It's going to show three different spread directions. But what are the numbers going to look like? Zero's going to have higher outputs. One eighty's going to have the lowest, and two seventy's going to have that middle. Okay. Can everybody hear that? Everybody follow that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Zero's going to be the most because it's head fire. 180 is going to be the lowest because it's uh, burning upslope against the wind, and 270 is going to be right in the middle-ish. Let's see if that's valid. Let's see if we know what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 0 is 198 is the highest, 180 is 190 is the lowest, and 270 right in the middle, like literally right in the middle. <laughs> yeah, so... I mean, and the flame, and interestingly enough, the flame lengths are all pretty much the same. But that's probably the nature of the fuel bed. Like, grass doesn't really care. It's going to burn what it's going to do. Short grass. Uh, I would be willing to bet we'd see some differences in flame lengths. Okay, so I'm, whenever I'm like, I'd be willing to bet, i got to go change the fuel model. Why do I, oh, I always do that. I'm going to change it to, let's try a chaparral. See if there's any differences. What the hell is this? Oh. Flame lengths, 100. What did I do right here? Oh, I don't know. This. Yeah, interesting. That's still about the same. Hmm. So, what does this tell you? The uh, so I, all I did was the same inputs, but I changed it to a few model four chaparral. I thought that the flame lengths might be different, but the flame lengths are still the same. What does that tell you about the model? Step. Yeah, 
fairly static, right? Do you guys think, would you normally expect to see a difference in flame lengths for a fire that's burning uphill against the wind versus the one that's ripping uphill, or no? The slope has gotten a little to do with it, too. Yeah. We, we got it off 15%. I think if we increase the slope, we'll see bigger differences. Increase the slope? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't like the way you think. Let's see what we got. So we're going to increase the slope. Ah, there is a difference. So that magnifies the difference, too. Yeah, yeah, good call, man. Yeah, good call. Yeah, this is how you play with it, you know? Um, so what's that saying is slope is having an effect on the flame lengths, and wind direction is not really something that affects it. Then again, this is how you get to know behavior. You just start changing these things. And but at the same time, when you get to 30 foot flame lengths, like, it doesn't really matter. Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> Whatever, I'm just this is all existential behavior crap right now. Okay. We want to take a little five minutes. Are we good? Or yeah, let's take five minutes, guys. Try to uh, compress all the knowledge so far and make room for more. Okay. Yeah. No. This is even good for me because ultimately, if I'm going to be doing this for a
Dunder Mifflin and Sabre. Dunder, Dunder Mifflin and Sabre. <laughs> Okay. So you remember how I said that this becomes a personal choice how you want to manage this? Uh, wind and spread directions are uh, <coughs> clock. So the other option is degrees clockwise from north. So it really, it really does the same thing, but it's a, just a different input option. And what I've found is that some people do the first one, some people do the other one. It really doesn't matter. It's just you really have to know uh, which one you're using. Uh, and again, it's degrees clockwise from upslope is, if you look at it underneath, it's direction the wind is pushing the fire. And degrees clockwise from north is direction from which the wind is blowing. So that's a different metric. So I'm going to click it down to degrees clockwise from north. And we're going to go back to the example we were just using. Is everybody still there? Okay. <coughs> Click OK, click OK, and then so again, see how this has changed now from wind direction from north? Let's do what we did before. <coughs> um, click on the arrow, let's see what this says, because I, if I believe, if I recall correctly, it should bring up a different uh, figure. Wind direction from north is the direction from which the wind is blowing. And this is the usual way of specifying wind direction. Et cetera, et cetera. And so this is, this is see how the arrows are, are 180% different. This is what we're used to. This is the language that we're used to using out on the landscape. So, so a west wind becomes a 270 wind. An east wind becomes a 90 degree wind. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's you know it's pretty straightforward. But the thing that it changes is remember how before like a zero was a head fire, and remember this is still in relation to the slope. So 180 becomes, I think of that. I think, uh, wait, let me think for a second. Not going to rust off, not going to rust off. Because, so this is the wind direction. You're still going to need the, the direction that the fire is burning. There's a tab that says slope or aspect. Does it? Or aspect. All right, so let's click in zero. So actually, let's click in 180. Oh, uh, okay, that's what it is. Yeah, because I was going to say, right, so all this tab is is telling you the wind direction, right? So you're still going to need to know where the aspect is. All right, perfect. Thank you, Rich. So aspect is the direction the slope faces. We all know that. So then this is actually that same same diagram, but it's applying <coughs> to just the aspect. So we all know a north slope is, is again, this is the same language that we're used to. So a north slope is going to be facing, uh, well, actually, no, this would be, this is opposite as well too, right? So a south facing slope, I would think that would be, uh, would be the arrow would be down, right? Because if, if you're facing a north facing slope, you're facing 180 degrees, right? So if you're facing the south facing slope, you're facing zero degrees because you're looking at it, south facing is behind you. So again, it's opposite. It's complicated. Don't confuse that. I know it's super confusing. This is so. I, for the record, what I use is I use the first one because it simplifies this for you. Uh, so let's set it up. Say we want a south-facing slope. Let's see if this works correctly. And let's do this different. So there's going to be a difference in a north-facing slope, and a, there should be a difference between north and south. So let's do zero, north-facing, and we'll do 180 south-facing. Let's see what that looks like. So zero and 180. Wind direction is from the north. Let's do, or er, I'm sorry, not from north, but 180 from north. So 180 from north. So what I'm trying to set up here is a south wind, and I want to see what the relationship to a south and a north face, face slope would be. So this is why you always want to know what your inputs are and what you think they're going to be and what they should be. So let's puzzle this out. So if I have a 180 degree wind and I have a zero north slope. So remember, right, we said zero was north and 180 was south. So what should our fire behavior outputs be? 
when we press run the run. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Zero. So this is, you think in, okay, so the zero is the matchup. So which one is going to be with the wind and slope, and which one is going to be wind against slope? The zero should be with the slope, right? You guys concur with that? I think that's right. I think so. We'll find out. <laughs> well, we will find out. Oh, yeah, you can do it that way. My, my point only is that I want you to get to the point where you kind of puzzle out beforehand so that you can verify whether you're doing it correctly or not. You'd be like, oh, that's not like, oh, God, it wasn't supposed to look like that. I did something wrong. So let's see. Let's see what we did. Uh oh. <laughs> so, yeah. so that isn't what we thought. And I thought that was right, too. So zero aspect is a slower rate of spread. The 180 is the higher. So let's go back to the inputs and puzzle that out. Um, so aspect. We put in 0 and 180, and then the wind 180, and which one was the highest? It was the 180, right, on both? They're both aligned. So they would both be aligned. And I think that makes sense if you look, well, it, it, it makes sense only in that the arrows on both those figures are going the same direction. It's like if you're on the south-facing slope, you're not standing looking at, at the south-facing slope, you're standing on the south-facing slope looking to the direction if that makes sense. Like you're, you're if looking you're on at the south, you're looking up slope at it. No, you're turned around looking at it. Oh, so you're standing on the slope looking. Oh, yeah. You're looking at the direction, like looking a, from the aspect. But that's the opposite of the arrow. Yeah. So the arrow sense. points up slope. It's like points up slope. Yeah. Okay. It seems <laughs> slightly crazy. Though. It does a little crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So again, you got you got to look at your inputs, and it gets super complicated when you got the aspects. So again, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna go back and change this. Directions. I like degrees clockwise from upslope because I always know that the wind is pushing the fire upslope, and that and then I can change the direction of the wind vector. So I always know that the fire wants to burn upslope, and the only thing I have to change then is the wind direction, and that will allow you to vector things. So you guys do what you want. Make that choice. See how I said in the beginning, this is a personal choice you have to make. You might be more comfortable with the other way. That's totally cool if you get it figured out. But don't try to go back and forth between these two because you will in invariably, inevitably, get confused by it. And I was confused by that other one, I would say, because I always do this direction of windbacker from slope when I do it at all. Okay? What else do we need to add to that? So thank you for helping puzzle that out. I apologize, it's my phone. Chief two. I'll call him back. All right. <laughs> That's good stuff right there. All right, let's go back to the module. Try to get through the surface. Ah. Questions? We good. So we're at slope now. This is pretty simple. Slope is either specified as percent or degrees. Um, you guys. We're the way we usually uh, talk about percent in fire is percent slope, you know, 10% slope, 50% slope. Uh, so that's uh, usually a no-brainer. Usually just use the percent. That's what people are used to seeing. Let's see. I have a quick question. Yeah, sure. So say you mess with everything and you just want to go back to the defaults. Is yes. there like a default button to hit or do you have to start a new run? <laughs> there is not a default button All right. to click. I've done those a couple of times. I bounce back and I'm like, why does this look different from what you got? It's because I went on the right. You right. right. You just reinstall it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you throw your computer in the trash. <laughs> now, I, I want to say that if you just turn off the program, uh -huh. just X out of the program, and you go back and open it back up, I believe it always defaults okay. to do that. Yep. I'm almost positive of that. In fact, I don't know. Want to take a look? I'll do it. Oh, I hate to do it. I'm going to do it. I'll do it. You want to do it, Sarah? All right, let us know. There's a, there's I would do it, but I don't know how to get file. back. <laughs> Sorry. She's going to do it for you. That's a great question, though. As far as I know, there's no, like, press key. Yep. It just goes back to your standard input. There you go. When in doubt, restart. <laughs> great question. Great question. All right. So are we all on the same page now? Everybody in the same spot? 
So we're in the surface input module and we're looking at the options and now we're on the slope tab. Again, percent or degrees, whatever you want, however you want to calculate it. And then, so then this is kind of cool and this actually I believe comes up in 490 is slope steepness is either specified on the worksheet or calculated for map measurements. This is almost like more like a tool you can use. I don't know if you guys have ever been through the field observer class or any other classes that they go through map work. But if you click on uh, calculate for map measurements, the way that you calculate or the way that you actually get slope, and you can do this with any map. You have to know the map scale, of course, and you have to know the contour interval on the map. Uh, you guys know what the contour interval is, all those red, red lines, right? And you have to know the interval between the two. There's some that are 20, most of them are 40, which means that there's five lines between every 200 feet, and then there's some that are 100. You have to know, some are in meters, some are in feet. You have to know what that is. You have to know what the elevational difference between the two lines are. Um, and then you have to know the, uh, the map distance. And so if you have those two, and that way you can calculate the slope. And it's really just rise over run. You have to know um, how far up you're going in elevation. So you say it's a 40 foot contour interval, you're going up, let's say five, you count five intervals, that's 200 feet, right? Um, so that's your rise. And then you say a map distance is one inch, whatever that, um, yeah, actually that's cool. I think that, yeah, this actually has the representative fraction. So it's a one to 24,000 map, which is your standard, seven and a half minute quadrangle map. You know, you guys get the quad maps. Those are seven and a half minute. One to 24 maps. Say your contour interval is, oh God, that's right. You have to do it. Uh, one, on a one to 24, I think it's one inch is 2,000 feet, right? Who's moving? Field observers, raise your hand. It's 2,000, right? Thank you, Mr. Smith. Contour interval would be 40. 40, yeah, what did I say? 2,000. No, 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 not the contour, no, not the contour, the map distance. So on a 1 to 24,000 map, oh, an inch, an inch oh, really? equals 2,000 feet, flat line distance. So that's what you have to know your rise and your run. So it's kind of like that Ridge of Valley elevational difference. So if you, you measure five contour intervals up, right, that gives you up 200 feet, and then you measure, say, three quarters of an inch from one point to the other, that's 2,000 divided by 75, which is 1,500 feet. So that gets you contour interval, 40 foot contour intervals, like we said. Map distance was 1,500 feet. We well, measured that. That thing says in inches, so you just do the output you got on the ruler, and it doesn't Oh, you're out. right, it does. Oh, that's cheating. That's totally cheating. All right, thanks, Richard. All right, so let's say 0. 0.75 inches. That is so cheating. I'm old school fobs. Um, number of contour intervals was, we said five. So, and then you calculate it and it'll give you uh, your output. Oh, oh, does it give you, it should give you your slope. Oh, it doesn't actually give you, that's right, it doesn't actually give you the output. But what it does is it, it measures the slope. So anybody... It factors in the slope. It factors the in the slope rate. automatically, yeah. Instead of you putting, it's a 15% slope. Um, if you don't already know what the slope is, you can just do it on a map really easily. It's really easy to do it, actually, and you can measure the actual slope. Right. Make sense? Kind of? That's right. Don't worry about that too much. Like I said, it's a tool. If you ever need to actually calculate the slope on a map, this is a tool that lets you do it. And all you need to know is the, the RF, the representative fraction, the contour interval, which all that is on the legend, by the way. And then you just got to do the map distance. It and the number of intervals. It would be. I, I think there's actually. I would think there'd be a way. Let's go back to the options here. And oh, under tools you can do. There's a separate. Where is it? Under tools on the top bar. On the toolbar. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. It'll give you that. Under slope. For map. Slap slope for map measurements. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I totally forgot about this. You can actually do it here, too, and it'll do that calculation for you. So, anyway, we're getting a little off subject here with the behavior. But, yeah, you should know that there are some tools like this in here. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, anyway, what were we talking about? We were talking about slope. So, most of the time, however, 
I mean, you know, again, junk in, junk out. As we have seen, slope is something that affects flame lengths, rate of spread, that sort of thing. So you should at least have a good idea of what the slope actually is. If you're good at judging slope, awesome. Most people actually aren't when it comes to what measuring slope actually is. Um, it's super easy to do it on a map. Just grab a map, do the distance, um, and uh, you can plug it in here and get it that way. So I, I do want to emphasize that slope is something you want to try to get reasonably accurate to get reasonably accurate outputs. So anyway, the default is percent and the steepness is specified on the worksheet, which means that you are going to specify. Copy? Okay. Copy. All right. So this is going to outputs. All of these, a lot of these are inputs. Okay, what you're inputting, now we're getting over this side of it, which is outputs. And this is simply the outputs that when you run a run, that it reports to you. So remember how we, how we did the default and surface rate of spread, just the rate of spread, and the flame length, those were the two that popped out. Well, if you click any more of these, you can get other things. You can get the fire line intensity. You can get uh, a fire characteristics chart. You can actually get a diagram. And see how I'm clicking all of these? It actually, um, the last one you click, it, it gives you a, a definition of these. If you're curious what it is, you're like, oh, what is this? I don't know. So go back, press OK. I made some changes here. Press OK. I'm going to run it real quick. Ah, oh, I. Okay, so for this, yeah, okay, I'm going to go back to the input. I'm going to go back to options. I'm going to go back to basic outputs. For this surface spread distance tab, obviously, distance is a function of the outputs and time, right? Distance, you have to know how long you're burning. So it's one of those things that triggers if you click it. Click OK. If you try to run it and you haven't put an input in, all right, so I want to know how long is it going to burn in two hours. So I put a two there, I, then, then it's happy, you press that. And then this is a, a diagram. And this is another thing you 490 uh, students are going to have to look at because this shows you, and this is actually, this is super helpful when you go, remember that directions tab? When you start messing with that directions tab, this diagram is very useful because it shows you two things. One, this red arrow is the direction of maximum spread from upslope, and blue is the direction of the wind vector. So right now, what is this diagram showing us? They're in line. They're in line with what? Upslope. Yeah. So the fire you're going to get right now, based upon your inputs, is an upslope fire. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a head fire upslope. And when you go back, if you were to go back to these wind vectors, well, actually, it should have multiple, shouldn't it? Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay. Remember how in the beginning, remember we had 0, 180, and 270 as the direction of the wind vector, which is the direction of the wind versus the slope. Go to these diagrams. So this is the first one, which is just straight up slope. You see how on this next one, when direction of wind vector from up slope is 270. So remember 270, which is an east wind in this case, because of the way we have it set up. It gives you the direction of the wind vector going to the left, to the west, is 270. You see how the red arrow, what's the red arrow again? Direction of the spread. It's the, yeah, it's the direction the fire is spreading. This is vectoring. This is a, something that you have to do in 490. They give you these inputs, and you have to model this vectoring. So all this is showing is because upslope is trying to force the fire, you know, the fire is trying to follow the slope upward, as fire always does for the most part. It's also being influenced by a flanking fire, and so it's, it's not going to go in this direction of the wind directly because slope is overriding the wind, and it's not going to go straight up slope because the wind is overriding the slope. It's going to be somewhere in between. In this case, because if we have a relatively, uh, I guess, relatively strong wind versus a slope, it's going 281 degrees. See this? So this red line is going 281 degrees. At 490, when you do the vectoring stuff, it, it asks you to do this vectoring and it says, you know, and you can put your outputs and you can mess with this. Is it, all right, does everyone follow why it's doing that? It's because wind is pushing it to the left and slope is going up, but the fire is somewhere in between. And uh, this is one of these really cool diagrams that let you verify that this is the way I wanted it to go. Because if it's the complete opposite, you know 
that one of your inputs is wrong. Cool? Alright. And I'm wondering if there's another one. There should be one for zero. I don't know why it's not on here. Oh, you know what? Scroll down. There it is. Thank you. Yep. Scroll down. So this is the 180, the down slope. So up slope is there. The wind. So in this case, it's showing you that uh, wind has overridden the slope, has it not? In this case? So even though it's an upslope fire, the wind is actually strong enough to override the slope and the fire, which is the red arrow, is actually burning downhill. We venture to get... We venture to guess that maybe we put this at like one mile per hour? I think there might be a change. Let's see. I wonder if that would be enough to override it. Went too far, went too far. So you start to see these differences in these arrows. See, with a one mile per hour wind, even though the wind is a downslope wind, the slope is overriding it, and the fire is in fact burning uphill. See that? Yep. And then on, on the next one, what's happening? The the wind is not is having a little bit of an influence, but it's vectoring just a little bit, just 343 degrees off slope. So it's not going directly up slope. The wind's pushing it a little bit. Cool. All right. So that's that. Let's go back to the inputs. Surface fire. So again, these are outputs. When you're really messing with stuff and you're messing with it spatially, that is you're trying to put it on a map or you're trying to figure it out across topography, I definitely recommend that you put the surface spread, uh, the wind slope spread direction diagram up here as one of your outputs. Um, and then you can put other stuff on here, mess with those. Okay, and then there's wind outputs. And this is the easy stuff. This is just, what do you want to see? Um, oh, you know what, this, okay, so this would be, if you do that, if you do a wind adjustment factor, and yeah, I forgot about that. You did like the 20 foot and the wind adjustment factor, and you wanted to see what the output was. If you were to go to this and put mid flame wind speed, it would actually tell you in the outputs what the what it calculated. And the same thing uh, for any of these in this effective wind speed limit, it would tell you if you m met the effective wind speed limit. Um, remember what the wind speed limit is where a fire, the, the rate of spread, the flame lengths reach a certain point and it doesn't go anymore because the, the Rothermel equation, the algorithm, says this is the maximum flame length you're going to get off this fuel model during this fuel scenario. Um, and it'll, if you click this, it'll tell you whether it got exceeded or not. You guys want to see what that looks like? Yeah? All right, let's do this. Yeah. Because uh, we'll get through these outputs. So I'm going to put effective wind speed, effective wind speed limit, and if it got exceeded. And press OK. So what I'm going. So what would we need to put on here to to mess with this that inputs or to mess with those outputs? What would we want to put in? in the inputs? Higher winds. Mm -hmm. uh, we could mess with fuel moisture. That's that's actually a good call. But we but what Sal said, we want to mess with the wind speeds because we want to see what that limit is, right? Uh, I'm just going to put zero for that. So for, I'm going to put in a 5, a 15, a 30, a 45, 50, and a 70 mile per hour wind. In a, and I'm going to do a fuel model. Okay, I guess it only goes to 45. Never mind. So that what it did is, okay. Let me break. Okay, 40 mile per hour is your limit. Again, you see how this is zero to 40 miles per hour? Apparently it will only model to 40 miles per hour. I've never tried to model outside of 40 miles per hour. So. <laughs> and I'm going to change the fuel model back to one because I know that has a pretty low effective wind speed. In other words, you know, a grass fuel model, especially a short grass one, only has so much energy, you know, and more wind is going to reach that limit pretty quick. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. So when I click off of that, it gets rid of everything except for the one hour fuel moisture. Okay, and uh, 40, it will keep the slope, whatever you want for the slope. All right, click on that, run it. Okay, you see how wind speed, five miles per hour, flame length, fire line intensity, rate of spread, all this is 136, and then it, see how it hits 297, and then it hits 297 and 297. What do you think the maximum effective wind speed is? 15. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's somewhere in there. If you really wanted five. to know, yeah, it's, it's between 5 and 15, so 
So you do five, let's do seven, nine, eleven, thirteen or something. What did I do? Oh, okay, okay. Oh, I'm going to dump these off because I know it's not that high. So I know what's, now we know, right? It's somewhere between nine and seven, which is probably eight. <laughs> or so. It could be a decimal, actually, technically. But that's, that's where, like, it, it doesn't make any sense to model anything higher than 11 at this moisture scenario. Okay, so that's your maximum effective wind speed. And all that is saying is that this grass model, at least with the algorithm, will not burn more than 297.3 chains per hour. And you will never get more than a 7.9 foot flame length off of a grass model 1. Trivia question, I don't know <laughs> what the real utility of that is, but sometimes you want to know that. And then, so you scroll down. Oh, let's see. Oh, it's actually, oh, here, it tells you. Oh, that's right. It actually tells you what the effective wind limit is, which is, what, what is it? 8.6. Yeah, it's 8.6. That's your effective wind speed limit. So it doesn't make any sense to model any more than 8.6, at least for this model. And then it'll tell you, if you can't do the math yourself, that was your max wind exceeded or not. So remember that caveat that I said what you can do back in the surface fire spread options uh, in oh shoot where is it here back in the wind speed tab remember this where it says impose maximum allow effective wind speed yes it's affecting it now no I say no I want to know Doc Brown I want to know where it is so go back run it is there going to be a limit now? No. It's going to go into infinity. So it's just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up. Yeah, it's crazy. So you're getting 13.5 foot flame lengths at 15 miles per hour. See what I'm saying? I don't know. This would, again, you would want to do this if you just kind of want to know what the upper limit was or if you thought you've seen it. Some people are saying, that there are some fuel models, I've heard people say that they're, they've seen it higher than the models for whatever reason, drow, Uncharacteristic drought, uncharacteristic fuel loading, you know, more potential energy available in the fuel bed to exceed some of these limits that Rothermel saw back in the 70s when he was putting this stuff together. Is that awesome sauce? All right. So wind outputs, and then we have slope outputs. Um, if, and all this is is, again, the slope steepness. If you do that calculation, it'll tell you what it is. Um, or you could use that tool that Richard showed us. See, intermediates, these are just some other stuff that... I've never really messed a whole lot with these, to be perfectly honest with you. Flame residence time might be an interesting one. What would flame residence time help you model? You guys know what flame residence time is? Yeah, how long it'll burn for, and it could tell you what the impact of the ground might be. What's that part? Consumption, yeah, you can make some assumptions about consumption. Assumption about consumption, that's pretty awesome. That's the line of the day. Uh, you can make some assumptions about that. You can make some assumptions about maybe what the impact to the soil is and that sort of thing. Yeah, okay, so, and then fuel outputs, again, you know, it, depending on what you mess with on the inputs, actually this is going full circle. So that fuel load transfer portion, I would be willing to bet if we went back and plugged in that dynamic fuel model, in fact, why don't we do this? I'm going to put in an output the fuel load transfer portion. Remember that from the dynamics? It's the transference of the live or the dead to the live or the live to the dead. Remember how we were like, well, maybe it's like 45% because I put the 50%, but then when we went back to the, the way it automatically calculated it, it, uh, it had a, a higher number, so it was wetter, and we were kind of guessing about it. Oh, I'm gonna, let's go back to that output. God, I'm just trying to remember what we were doing. What was the fuel model we had? Shrub. Is that a dynamic model? Let's choose a dynamic model. Let's try one of the shrub models. Let's try step text. Let's try shrub one. That's a dynamic model. This is a D. Shrub one. And I'm going to do outputs because remember, those buttons are all outputs. So it just gives you information at the end. Oh, here it is. So right here, there's a thing that says the fuel, the amount of fuel load transferred is 44%. So at this fuel moisture, which is five 
for one, five at ten, eighty for herbaceous, fifty for life fuel moisture in this fuel model. Sorry. Forty-four percent of it is being modeled as dead. That's transferred from the life category to the dead category. Because remember how we were trying to guess on that before? This will actually tell you. Cool. And so that's just based on the fuel moisture that you put in there. It's based on the fuel moisture, exactly. So if we change the li and it's the live was it the herbaceous that it's dependent upon? So let's say that's a hundred. Let's say we change that eighty to one hundred and fifty percent. What do we? Th what's going to happen to that forty-four percent number? Remember, it's transferring from dead to live. The wetter something is, the more alive it is, right? So, I'm, what do you guys? What's going to happen to that forty-four percent? Hopefully, is it going to go up or down? Down. Should go down, I think, because it is transferring from dead to live. Oh yeah, zero percent of it at one hundred fifty percent is transferred. It's all being modeled as li uh, as live. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It's actually modeling from live to dead. Yeah. What's that? That might be a green up. Yeah, it's that green up. Yeah, because one hundred fifty percent. I think that's what we put in, right? Yeah, one hundred fifty percent for the herbaceous. Yeah, that's that's pretty green. Actually, we can we can look at it. We go back to the chart for what this looks like. Remember this chart. 100% is mature foliage, new growth. 200% is maturing foliage, still developing. 150% is means that plant is entering, you know, into blooming and leaves and all that sort of thing. So, all right. So we have gotten through all of the tabs on the surface fire spread. We don't have to worry about the aspen outputs and that sort of thing because that's that's not super relevant. Uh, is everybody pretty clear on those inputs? Okay. So that's your main. That's the surface inputs. Again, that's just. And these surface inputs, you're almost always going to have the surface model on. So this afternoon when we come back, if you guys come back, uh, we'll start looking through some of these other tabs, the crown, fire, safety zone, containing some of those too. Um, there's a lot less to those, but we'll go through some of the little caveats and quirks and that sort of thing. So, all right. So what I want to do is give you guys an hour. You guys want a full hour? Probably need it now to get lunch and stuff. If everyone is back here before an hour, we'll get started. But uh, for now, we'll give you an hour, which we'll bring back at 1. And then I'll try to get you guys out of here by, I don't know, 2.30 or 3. Is that going to work? Yeah. If you got to leave before that, you got to leave. It's cool. At this point, a lot of what you, you can do a lot of damage with what you guys should know now. Yeah. So we'll just teach you. you <laughs> so you can just do more afterwards. We'll see you guys at 1 o'clock sharp. Thank you. Hold it down. I don't think it's super accurate, but I don't, know. I don't really know how to answer that question, I guess. I think at times it can be pretty accurate. Um, especially if you do your homework and you really get the, if you really get the fuel washers right, you get the models right, and you get all that stuff right, it's it's reasonably close. Um, and they've done a lot of work to refine that over the time. Like the fuel models are, are pretty accurate. But there's so much, you know, the, anytime you try to model nature or have any sort of variability like that, there's going to be differences. So that's it's just a hard question to answer. I would say that I think what I've heard is. The more homogenous the fuel model, the primary carrier of the fire, that is, the less complex the system, the more accurate it is. And you have to keep in mind, and does that make sense? So if there's a lot of variability, there's a lot of green brush, dead brush, logs, sticks, whatever, that's, there's a high degree of variability on the landscape. That's, that's going to be really hard to model versus a grass field which is, they're pretty good, you know, the rate of spread on, on just a fuel model one or fuel model two, you know, short grass or whatever, that's going to be pretty easy because there's less things for there to be differences in. I do know that a lot of the original modeling was built on, I, I think the rate of spread models and stuff were really built on like just a bed of pine needles. Right, and so Behave I, assumes that the fuel bed is Continuous. Continuous, and that the slope is the same. Right. 
So no variability. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. That is that is the most important caveat. What she just said is that it's all steady state. There's no change through time or space. It's it's just modeling that one place, and that's why in 490 in some of those classes when you start to do the vectoring, you actually have to start to model differences in aspect, differences in wind in relation to that aspect, um, and the slope and all that sort of thing. So and because behave just behave runs as a point source ignition, mm -hmm. not as a continuous. Front. What is a point source ignition? Oh, just one point of ignition. It's, it's a dot ignition on the landscape. That's and yeah. It, it models as a dot with a continuous rate of spread from that. And the other thing too is that once you light it, it doesn't. There's um. You guys ever noticed with a fire when you do like a dot fire, it kind of takes a little bit of time for it to reach its equilibrium, its um, rate of spread where it burns as fast as it wants to burn. Like you don't just light a fire and it starts ripping off a lot of times, right? It has to kind of build up a little steam until it gets to a point. There's actually, there's a curve associated with that where it's, I guess it would be like a J where it slowly builds up and then it reaches a steady state when things are burning. How do I say that again? So it, it doesn't go 0 to 60 immediately. Yeah, it's kind of what I'm saying. And so it doesn't factor in that. It, it takes it immediately to the to at that wind speed, at that slope, at that fuel moisture regime. The minute you light it, it's automatically burning at that um, at that rate of spread, at that flame length. Where in in reality, there's that build up until it gets to that point. Think of that strip that you lay out. You know, when you're burning, that strip isn't burning the way it's going to burn. Right when you light it, it's not burning the same way it's going to be burning in 10 minutes, right? Because it needs to interact with the environment, it needs to preheat the fuels around it, um, get to that point of self-sustained combustion. And a lot of times, too, when you light a fire, it's it's not natural consumption or uh, combustion because it's using an accelerant. It's gas and diesel is is fueling that fire versus the natural fuels, which has a, is a different sort of combustion source. You know what I'm saying? The difference between a wood campfire or a gas and diesel campfire, which is what we use with drip torches. So you have to wait for the effects of that to ameliorate off. And we almost never do. Like when we do prescribed fire, a lot of times, unless you really just light it from the top and let it chunk down and do natural burning, most of the time we're lighting strips. So half the time it's going to be influenced by that accelerant that we use to light the fire. And then maybe the other half it's going to be a free burning fire actually existing in the environment until it hits the strip that you just lit, you know, above it. You guys follow me with that? So yeah, there are a lot of assumptions built into behave that make it really hard to answer the question whether it's accurate or not. So I guess maybe another way of looking at it is again kind of what Sarah was saying, is that it's accurate for small snapshots in time. So it's accurate for the fuel model in that point until it hits something that changes it. Um, yeah, so. Anyway, it's as good as we got for now. <laughs> And there's other models. There's more, more robust models. So this does one point and free burns it. There's other models, which is like the Farsight model, which takes it takes uh, what it does is it does propagations where it does one point and then it burns a little bit bigger. Now there's two or three points along the perimeter, and then it gets a little bigger, and then there's like five or six points, and so it kind of exponentially increases the number of equations, and it, it turns into an actual perimeter. Like on a GIS, it actually makes a fire perimeter and it interacts with the landscape. But there's a lot more inputs that go into that. You have to have weather files and fuel files and uh, aspect and slope and all that stuff associated with it. So, uh, Behave is really like the lowest common denominator, the most accessible, the easiest. But if you learn the concepts that are associated with it, the inputs, the outputs, you can get into this sort of higher level modeling pretty easily, actually. It's not too hard. Yeah, it's really not. And a lot of the data, the input data, is a lot more accessible now. If, if you know a little bit of GIS, you can actually pull that data down off of GIS, off our national database. So, anyway, okay, I don't want to go too much further in that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Anybody else have any inputs to that one? It's the question that always comes up, but it's probably the hardest to answer. Yeah. That's a good question. You should think. Okay, so there's a few different ways we can go from here. I think what I want to do, though, is I do think I want to go through the rest of these modules um, sort of one at a time and talk about them, but we're not going to spend a ton of time with these because uh, what I do want to do is I want to make sure we get to some examples 
the best way to learn anything like this, obviously, is to go through some real world examples or, or study examples, whatever. I'm going to move this. So, um, I think what we'll do is we will just go down the list. So let's go to Crown Fire. So when you want to, everybody with us? So you can keep the surface. Some of these require the surface control or the surface fire spread module. Some of them don't. We'll just keep the surface fire module on in the background at all times. Um, so I'm going to click on Crown. So the Crown Fire module um, obviously is, is trying to model Crown Fire. There's three different types of crown fire. There's passive, active, and independent. And uh, let's click on the option. So when you click on the options menu for crown fire, you have your input options. Pretty simple. Your surface fire intensity. And that's, you know, intensity is a measure of heat from the surface fire. The heat of the surface fire is very important to how a crown fire is either to be initiated or sustained. And you can either have that as flame length or fire line intensity. It really doesn't matter. The default is flame length. Uh, that's easier for people to get their head around than fire line intensity. I can spout out six or eight foot flame lengths a lot better than I can do 1,000 or 1,500 BTUs per square foot. I don't know about you guys. You might be smarter than I am, which is possible, but uh, probable even. But I can't do fire line intensities very easily. So. Uh, anyway, so flame length or fire line intensity, and those are both inputs. So for crown fire, you have to have one of these two as an input. You will notice that these two are the only inputs to crown fire. The outputs, remember what the outputs are? All the outputs are are just stuff that gets reported after you run the run. So this just becomes your um, preference. This just becomes your preference of what you want to see. And uh, this is for your spread, the crown fire spread, and then these are the intensity outputs. Now, again, with some of your like pre-work problems, it asks for some of these outputs, so it kind of depends on how the problem is set up. The one I like is this uh, critical surface flame length. Critical surface flame length means at, one, at what flame length does a crown fire trigger. So, let's keep this at flame length. Some of these other ones might require. So let's press OK, and then let's go back to see what it does to our input page. So it adds a whole lot, well not a whole lot, but it adds a few more inputs to this. So does it make sense to be looking at crown fire in a shrub one fuel model? Not not no, too much. You can't have crown fire, but this crown fire, it, crown fire is not really talking about a shrub crown fire or a grass crown fire. It's really talking about a timber crown fire. So let's put in, oh I don't know, Let's do, let's do, I don't know, let's do TL6. Let's do two, TL, timber letter 6. Let's see if this works. Then you have the main inputs for the crown module, our canopy base height, which, we, uh, which is in feet, 0 to 100 feet. This is a little different than, say, the crown ratio. This is the, uh, there's a picture here. Oh, there was a picture. Oh, I thought there was a picture. Well, the canopy base height is the height. <coughs> yeah, it's the base of the canopy. I'm trying to find the actual words where we at. There it's are the, pictures. There are. Where are they at? Um, you have to click on. Um, oh, one of the things. Yeah. Yeah, I always thought there were. Yeah, that's a picture. So I thought they had a diagram, which is a little easier to see. At any rate, it's it's the height at which it's the height at which the canopy starts, basically. So a 40 foot canopy base height would be 40 feet off the ground. Then you hit the main canopy. So you know how like a ponderosa pine or or like say on Mount Laguna the Jeffrey pines or whatever up there. You know most of the time you're going up 10, 15 feet or so before you hit you hit the base of the canopy. So it's a canopy base height. So I don't know. Let's do 15 feet. Put in whatever you want. Let's say 15 feet. Yes, Jason. I'm, I'm sorry. Before we get too far away. Please. Right? Um, with the surface fire, if, they, if there's some more clarification on that, because I'm figuring in my head with BTUs on the surface fire, yeah, the way I'm thinking would be different than your flame lengths, because then that would put off a different heat signature for black and white flame. So there's a relationship between intensity and flame lengths, at least in the model. 
Okay. And generally, the higher, I think the way it is, is the higher the flame lengths, the more intensity there is. So, and then the way this relates to crown fire is depending on the canopy base height, the higher the flame lengths, and thus correlating the higher the fire line intensity, the easier it is to propagate and sustain a crown fire. In other words, it's really, if you just think of it practically, if you have a, a stand of trees, if you have a really light surface fire coming through here with low fire intensity, low flame lengths, it's not going to generate crown fire, right? Versus if you have a, a large flame lengths, you know, really intense, a lot of intensity being pushed into the crowns, preheating those crowns, you know, causing them to ignite. Depending on that threshold, you have to think about it, at some point it's going to trip some threshold where it's going to do passive fire, which is just torching, okay, or active crown fire, which is sustained but requires surface fire, or you're going to have independent crown fires, I don't know, and, and you know, you don't usually see independent crown fire except for really steep slopes where it, it got up in the crowns and it just, it just catches the crowns of the fire, uh, catches the, the fire catches the crowns of the trees or whatever. So does that make sense, just conceptually? Yeah, well, I was just thinking if you had a high BTU surface fire, but it had low flame lengths, yeah. that's still putting off greater BTUs than that. Uh, I was just curious. Uh, I mean, you you could. I, I guess there could be a relationship. I think it just, I think at least in terms of the model, all I'm saying is that the higher flame lengths is going to be also the higher intensities. But yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, you have little variations, right, where like you have a log that's going to be sitting there. That's going to be putting out some BTUs. So that's going to be kind of localized okay. as well. So, but like a log or something might initiate passive crown fire. What do you got? Curve? So, yeah. So, here Dang. in the little fire behavior, it kind of gives you a correlation uh, in light fuels and in heavy fuels uh, of the flame lengths that are being put off and an estimate of what the BTUs oh, that sweet. are being put off. Cool. Do you need one of those? Have you got some extras? Yeah. Or anybody? There's a few. So is did what I say is did what I say is accurate? Is it more or less correlated like that, or is there? I was looking for it. Oh, okay. But yeah, it, it shows like the difference between uh, like flame lengths in lighter fuels and the BTUs it puts off. Oh, okay. Versus heavy. Oh, fuels. so like a heavier. I got what you said. Like a heavier fuel might have lower flame lengths but high intensities. Right. Uh, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. It's not that's necessarily what you're like moving as quickly. Right. Um, but it's still holding that. Like where we were at yesterday with all that down. No, yeah, no, that's great. That's great, yeah. Yeah, puzzle it out. That's, that's great, man. Yeah, yeah, because that's true, right? You're putting on those intensities. But so if that would change your predictions, because then your flame height, obviously, your flame height is getting closer to the canopy base. So I guess it all comes down to the fuel model, really, doesn't it? Yeah, what that surface carrier is. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, okay. And and then the other, th I think what really drives this model, though. Yeah. So you definitely have to have sufficient heat and intensity to generate that crown fire. But what's really going to be determinant besides that is this canopy base height and the canopy bulk density. So I guess both those together it would come together. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. And you're thinking about it. You know, you're thinking of, you're thinking about it practically. No, it's good. This is what you need to do. <laughs> this is perfect. I like it. So anyway, canopy base height says say 15 feet for this example, and then you have what's called canopy bulk density. Anybody want to take a stab at what that is? It's pounds over cubic feet. So that's going to be a, a, a weight over area, or weight over volume. What bulk density? Canopy yeah. is. How dense? How dense the crown is in an, in a certain area. Yeah, so it goes from 0.001 to 0 0.062 pounds per cubic foot. Something I'm very familiar with. What's that? Something I can work out in my head really easily. Oh, that makes a lot of sense to you. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, no diagrams over here. Uh, so how do you gauge what this is? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, what is the answer to this question? Is there a chart? Yeah, let's see what this chart does. So I have no idea what it would be. Let's see. So it gives a few examples here. Let's say, let's see Douglas fir lodgepole pine. So up on Palomar, we have we have a big cone duck fir. So 
Um, and there's probably some, re I, I know that there's data and stuff that you can access in papers that give you these numbers. Um, yep, here we go. So for Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, we have canopy cover 70%, 59%, 47%. Down, if you keep scrolling down, I'm sorry I don't have a big enough screen here. It gives you canopy bulk density, 0 0.0161, 0 0.0138. This, I want to, we might discover, I think there's another way of determining this too, but I can't remember what it is right now. I'm whiffing on that one. It's the, uh, the tacos I had for, for lunch. Anyway, I think a lot of the time what I do is, uh, so if you just think about this, again, if you just think practically, right? So you know that 0 0.001 is going to be hardly any crown at all, whereas 0 0.062 is sort of the max. So if you think about like the densest stand you've ever seen, that would be the 0 0.062. You just kind of have to relate your real world experience to this. And uh, you may want to make a stab and, and justify why you're making that stab and relate it to a, a canopy type that you're used to. Anybody? Come on. Logical pine. Okay, a logical pine. And that's going to be on the higher end, like point zero zero six two. Mm -hmm. well, what, what, if you had to choose a number for logical pine, you know logical pine isn't the densest you've ever yeah. seen, but you know it's on the denser side. What might you put? Point zero four. Zero four or something. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, there's no wrong answer or right answer, but I would say that would be reasonably accurate. Um, I know there's places where you can get some of this reference. They have some of it in Behave, and there's other papers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So versus, let's say you had like a really open, like say Ponderosa Pine stand. You guys have seen any really open pondos or some of the thinner areas up on Mount Laguna, say in the Jefferies? What what might you guys be comfortable with that? One or two. Yeah, maybe in the twos. You know, maybe like a third of this dense. Point oh, point oh one five or point one two, something like that. I could buy that. So, all right, let's just put 0.2. Or 0.02, my, my apologies. My apologies. Okay. What else do we have to deal with here? All right, let's, let's simplify this. I'm taking the mid flame wind speed back to 20. What was that? Foliar. Foliar moisture. Oh, okay, that's a new one. What's foliar moisture? Oh, you guys are good. That's right. It, it is the moisture in the foliage. Now, one thing that we do not do here on the Cleveland is we don't take foliar moisture. Live foliar, not live foliar moisture. Uh, when I used to work, what's that? We have a few trees. If we started cutting the leaves out of them, that we kill our trees. Uh, this is something that you have to be familiar with, and there are places that take foliar moisture. When I worked in the Great Basin, we had trees there, and I would actually do foliar moisture in lodgepole pine and Douglas fir. And I got to know it a little bit, actually, uh, where I knew that, and actually there was a lot of applicability for prescribed fire, because I give a, I give a case example, some of you guys have probably heard, where we were trying to burn up the, uh, trying to burn up the conifers using aerial ignition in an aspen stand. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to generate I wanted to generate a crown fire uh, using uh, using a PSD machine in Aspen, and I knew from experience, having worked on the district for a year, few years, and taking the moistures that uh, in the summertime, when the uh, when the when the Doug fur I think it was the Doug fur fuel moisture dropped below about 100, you'd start to get that passive crown fire uh, in, in in group torching and that sort of thing. That was a trigger. And I also knew that once it was higher than about 120, it really you wouldn't get any uh, you wouldn't get any torching really too much. I mean, you might you get a little bit of torching here and there, but it wouldn't sustain. And that 80 was sort of like critical for that. Like when you get like 80, that was really that was like 60 for chaparral, or even less. So when we did our sampling for that, running up to the burn, and it was about I think it was like 100. We knew that we were gonna not get full on active crown fire, which I really didn't want to initiate because that's hard to manage, but I knew we'd get some good group torching, and that's what we did. So this is just a practical application of knowing uh, figures like that and knowing what those ranges are and knowing how to, you know, when to apply prescribed fire, or when to apply fire to reach an objective. 
So, um, let's choose let's choose 100 for foliar moisture. Actually, you know what? Let's do a range here because foliar moisture is a uh, is a pretty big driver of whether you're going to get crown fire. That and crown base height and the canopy. So let's do 80, 100, and 120. That ought to about be the low and the high ends. Is everybody with me? So what's it going to look like? You think? I don't know. Let's take a look. Oh snap. So this is a new one. Again, I always use the default. Uh, there's a conflict. Uh, what is it? It's been so long since I've actually read these. Okay, so most of the time when you get this, it it's going to force you to input an, uh, to provide another input so that it can run. So I'm going to guess it says configure the surface module. So we know what the surface module is, right? Remember the surface to use 20 foot wind speed and input wind adjustment factor or same thing and do calculate wind adjustment factor you guys remember that back to that wind adjustment factor thing um, and then it's the same ones down here but it's 10 meter 10 meter or you can deactivate the spot and crown modules uh, I'm gonna do this first one which is input the wind adjustment factor so see how it, it wants a wind adjustment factor here it wants to know because we're in, because the default I have on here because I didn't change it before was I have the 20 foot wind speed here. Remember how on the wind you can do mid flame wind speed or the 20 foot calculated adjusted. Uh, it's forcing me now because I have that to put in a wind adjustment factor. So for a uh, what are we going for? We're going here for like a Jeffrey Pine Ponderosa Pine stand. So what would you think the wind adjustment factor would be? Remember that? 0.3. 0.3. 0.3 would be pretty dense. Remember, because 0.3 would take a 10 mile per hour wind, a 20 foot, down to 3. It says partially sheltered. Partially sheltered, is that 0.3? Mm -hmm. or what, yeah, whatever the book says. I guess. 0.4 would be unsheltered. Fully unsheltered? 0.4 is on, and then 0.5 is the most. Yeah, because it really only goes to 0.5. Alright, so what are we saying? 0.3? It's kind of in the middle. Yeah. Alright, let's go 0.3. I like it. Now will it let us, please? All right, yes, it will. Okay. So what did it give us? That's interesting. It didn't change. It didn't change the foliar moisture at all, so maybe it's not relevant. Or it didn't change the rate of spread or intensities or anything. The foliar moisture on the left did not change the rate of spread or fire line intensity or flame lengths or anything. Which probably means it's not relevant. Hmm. So when something happens that's weird, you try to figure it out. Let's see if we got to crown. But so this is so we're talking about the crown module right now. We'll come back to this. See how it says there's there's a couple things you need to know here. One is this active ratio, and then active crown, and then the fire type. Let's scroll down and see if there's another one. Yep. So, if I recall correctly, you have to get to. So there's another one too. You have to get to one, and I believe one is the threshold where if you get to 1.0, that's active crown. Okay. And you have, see how it says active crown question mark. And then the fire type is conditional crown. All that really means is that, um, depending on the conditions, you get a crown fire. And that changes. So let's see if we can go back and, and, and throw our variables out a little bit more here. Let's see, go down to 70. Yeah, let's, go, let's go 50. Uh, 50, 60, 120. Let's go to like 150. I'm thinking I might need to change the fuel model. I think I might need to change a few more. Let's we'll see. Yeah, it doesn't change anything. Start playing with it. So this is all active crown. It really wants to get up in the crown. Like it's really happy getting up in the crown here. Even at 150% foliar moisture, that to me is telling me that the foliar moisture is not really driving this too much right now. Something else is at play. Foul play. What's that? Foul play. <laughs> Foul play. I don't know about that. You know what? Let's flatten the slope out a little bit. Let's see what happens when we put that down to like five. Okay. 
The slope is a factor, right? Yeah, we could play with that too. What, what's it do? Is it was that what it was it? Did you play with it, or are you just curious? Just curious. Okay. Well, I flatten the slope. We'll do that next. I flatten the slope out, and then um, see how it says transition to crown. Nope. And you see how the transition ra transition ratio? Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Is I was looking for the transition ratio, and there's two ratios. Yep. There we go. Oh, I can't, I'll have to look that up, and I have to look that up. This transition ratio. I think it's the transition ratio that the closer to one that gets, that's when it starts to switch to an active crown fire. Um, and see how it says transition to crown? No, it's not going to transition to a crown fire under that stupid slope. Okay, so we'll come back. We'll come back to what Jose was looking for for the uh, canopy base height. I want to mess with the slope a little bit. I want to do 5, 10, let's do 20, and maybe 30. Because slope definitely affects these things, right? We know that there's much more ability to get a crown fire when you have that slope helping you because slope works as wind. So let's see what the numbers look like then. So we will set, it doesn't change. Hmm. Come on. So you're just grinding through all the, all the tables here. Sorry, I missed it. So transition ratio. So the top end is 0 0.28. I need to go back and read that. So if the, the transition ratio is surface fire line intensity divided by the critical surface intensity. Is that what it is? The transition ratio is greater than or equal to 1, then the surface fire line intensity is sufficient for a transition to a crown fire. Okay. The, tr the second one, was that the active ratio or the transition ratio? That's the transition ratio. Okay, so it's one. the closer to 1 is... What I said, right? Yeah. Okay. Did you get the definition for active ratio? Uh, that I forgot. What the difference is between the two. Because the active ratio on all these is 2.03. The and active ratio is crown fire rate of spread divided by the critical crown fire rate of spread. Okay. If the active ratio is greater than 1 or equal to 1, then the fire may be an active crown fire. Okay. Right. Maybe. So the one I always look at is the transition ratio. And I try to get that, uh, you know, if I want to try to say, for instance, you want to initiate ground fire, which sometimes, so like you're going to have some problems in the pre-work where it's going to ask you, is it, what kind of ground fire is it going to be? It does, a, the examples do a better job of setting it up what I did here. I apologize. I'm just kind of throwing it off the hip here, but we're working it together. Um, it, you know, it, it, maybe it'll come up with like 0.8 or something as a transition ratio. So what do you think is the closer you get to 0.8? What do you think the crowd fire, or what the fire type might be? It's going to be like maybe pass. I think it says passive when it does that and the, on this uh, fire type. Let's go back and let's see what Jose said. Um, we'll keep the foliar moisture the same. Let's put the slope at like 25%. And then uh, crown base height. Let's do... So, yeah, and that's the thing, is 15 is pretty low for a canopy base height, actually. Let's do 20, 25, 30. See what the differences are. Oh, that's a lot of results. 1,200 results, good job. Scroll through, do a little transfer. Oh, no, I missed it. I thought I saw it. Transition ratio. So the higher the see how the can, the higher the canopy base height, the lower the transition ratio is. It just kind of demonstrates how that works. So the the more dense the bulk density, and the lower the canopy base height, and of course the higher the fire, the more the easier it is going to be able to transition. So transition to ground fire, all this is now. So anyway, all right, you can play with all that. All right, I think we'll have a better example of that. So, all right, so I think I, is everybody at least peripherally cool with that for now? We'll come back and do an example of that one. That one, kind of got to play with it a little bit. This one especially, like when you start doing like 
adding multivariates to try to get a response. You really need to have like good examples, unlike what I'm throwing out at you guys right now. So hopefully we can swing back to this and get a better example. So I'm going to get rid of the crown fire. And uh, we'll click on the safety zone, check out the options for that. The only options, you don't have input options, you only have output options. You have your safety zone separation distance, safety zone, safe, safety zone size, and the radius. So I'm going to click on all three as an output, and that will tell me what my output is. So the way you can use this module is if you want to try to determine what size of a safety zone you need. And of course, like this would be something like an F-band or somebody would do. So I'm going to change the fuel model back to Chaparral because we're all familiar with it. We'll keep uh, live weight moisture at 50. That's pretty dry, but we'll do that. Let's say it's the summertime. Um, you know what? I'm for ease. I'm going to go back to the surface fire module. I'm going to go back to the uh, the the wind speed, and I'm going to change it back to mid flame height, just so I'm doing mid flame wind speeds and not having to deal with the calculated. Okay. So that brings our mid flame wind speed back to seven. And you know what? I'm actually going to go back and change this too. The, uh, the direction thing to the wind is always upslope and surface fire spread is always only in the direction of maximum spread. So I'm ignoring those two things on the bottom. And that gets rid of the directions. It's always going to be going upslope, okay? Everybody cool with that? All right, perfect. I'm going to keep the slope at 25. Oh, that's for my diagram or whatever. We'll worry about that. Okay, so the new inputs you get here are suppression, the number of personnel. And I don't, by the way, I don't think these are this rep. rep um, let me see. I don't think this uh, is incorporating the new Finney research that comes out for safety zone sizes. The, it's currently being worked on now. In fact, the Fuels Tech Wesley Page on this district is, is up in the lab in Missoula right now work, uh, helping to work on this project, which is they're trying to redo these safety zone sizes instead of just like the rule of thumb like we have. They're trying to put a little better science in it, um, safe separation distance and that sort of thing. So anyway, number of personnel, let's say we got a crew. 20 people. Area per person. Well, I have no idea what the area per person is. Let's click on this little arrow. What does it say? Okay, so we have from 10 to 100 square feet. The area per person is the average area occupied by each person to be located within the safety zone. And it says a reasonable figure is 50 square feet. So that's uh, 10 by 5, right? Per person, which is enough to allow shelter deployment in the event it becomes necessary. Sounds good to me. I don't really have any reason to say otherwise, so we'll go with what the book answer says, right? 50 square feet. Number of heavy equipment, because remember heavy equipment has to be factored differently for safety zone sizes, if you guys remember that. Uh, do you want to do heavy equipment or no? Sure. Yeah, why not? All right, we're good. Good answer. <laughs> so you can have only 10 pieces of heavy equipment, so keep that in mind. <laughs> and then, uh, same thing. See if it gives a rule of thumb. Does it give a rule of thumb? Oh, maybe it'll be in the square. Okay, never mind. Let's say how many pieces of equipment? Three. Three dozers. Or maybe there's a skidgen. Whatever. Area per heavy equipment. Let's see if there gives us rule of thumb. For for what's that? Oh, here we go. For general planning, when the equipment types are not known, use a mean area of 300, but it's 100 to 500. So we'll use we'll use 300. Everybody following that? Mm -hmm. So we'll say 300. So we have 20 bodies that need an action. Well, yeah, I'm not going to get into the minutia, but like if you got three dozers, you should probably put the people to 23, right? But uh, whatever. We'll say the guys they're are hiding. In that 20. Yeah, they're in that 20. They're inside. They're the curtains down. What's that, Mark? Yeah, I'll just do 23. Copy that. I love it. Okay, so. Uh, do your cookie thing, and uh, so it gives you your surface rate and all those sort of things. And then what? We're, here we go. Safety zone separation distance, which means this is 134 feet. What did you get, Mark? 134. 134 is the same. That's funny. So you want 134 feet of separation distance between the fuel that is burning and your people. The size of it must be 1.8 acres, and the radius is 158 feet. What's the radius? It's half the diameter, right? So you actually need 316 feet, right? Yeah, with the three people added, it's 0.8 or 1.83 and 159. So it's about the same. 
Hopefully they're, they're not big boys that need 60 square feet. Or so. <laughs> the dozer operators can be. Oh yeah, that's true. 26. Oh man. Oh, Forget all those people. <laughs> they kept driving. They kept driving. Yeah. So you know, this is just a rule of thumb, but people use. I mean, use it. It's a tool. So it's here. But that's it. So that module is easy, right? That one's super easy. All right. Super simple. So then you have size of a point source fire. Uh, what are the options here? It's only output variables. Area perimeter, and then it can gives you uh, it can give you some diagrams. I'm going to click on this fire shape diagram. We'll go back and see what the inputs are here. Is there any change at all? It doesn't look like it. Let's see what the outputs are. So, I th what does this one tell you? This one tells you what, what's that? If you didn't already have it, it adds elapsed time. It does, right? Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, so we have, thank you. So it tells you how big your fire gets in, in the amount of time you have. That's right, I meant to take that out. Thank you very much. Everyone see that? You know how we already have uh, elapsed time here? In fact, let's go do that. We'll go back to the surface module, which that was an output, right? So was that a surface spread distance, I think, right? Was the one that triggered elapsed time? So that, oh, wait. The, Right. So I'm going to take, I'm going to get rid of size of point source fire and I'm going to go back. See how, so like he just said, if you have the distance or if you want a, a diagram for how long it burns, it'll bring up elapsed time. And if you go into the module for size of a point source fire, it will also bring up elapsed time. We have two hours. All it's saying is that you light a fire, you light a dot on the landscape because it's all it manages. And remember, it's all outputs. It's going to say in two hours, your dot under these fuel conditions and this fuel model, of course that won't ever change, right? Your fuel model won't ever vary over two hours of burning distance. I'm being sarcastic because obviously it will. It's, remember how it assumes that steady state? So this is really getting out there on that sort of shaky modeling. Um, 5,360 acres. That's how big it will get in a free burning condition. And then you got 988 chains of perimeter that you will have to control. Everybody follow that? It's a pretty simple. One. What's that? Easy to pick up. Super easy. We'll get that. Um, I wonder if there's something that would be. You know, let's. Uh, so what's a what's a typical suppression response? Like when do you you know how long does it take to get to a fire? Five to fifteen minutes. Five to fifteen minutes. Let's say fifteen minutes. Wait, that's not gonna be correct. Point two five. Actually, let's see what the input variables are. Point one. So point one would be six minutes to eight hours, which is a long response time. So point two five would be fifteen minutes. This is something you can do just you know in your backyard. Let's say fuel model four, that's our chaparral. These are the current fuel conditions. These are the current wind speeds, this is the current slope, so if you want to know how big is that fire that lights at the bottom of Palomar Mountain, how big is it going to get before we can get to it? So you know that rolling on scene is going to be 83 acres, you know? So this is something you can do for, I don't know, pre suppression planning if you're ever just kind of curious. Um, of course there's differences there, but I think this is a lot more applicable if you're looking for short term things like that, like how big might it be in a on a response time. Now, that, or how big a fire might be upon initial attack. So give it just 15 minutes to burn. But keep in mind, too, that remember how it models it? It models automatically at the maximum burning potential for chaparral. So in that 15 minutes, it might actually take five to seven minutes for that chaparral to get to a point where it's actually free burning up the hill. So maybe closer, maybe the acres for potential. Oh God! <laughs> Potential acres. I wish people got started like graded on that. Potential for 100 acres. I, w I always want to say, how big is the continental United States? That is your potential. Or, potential for and Mexico and Canada, because potentially it could burn the entire continent. Could it not? No. Yes, it could. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying, though. Yeah, it just cracks me up that people even. That's a soapbox thing, it just, I'm amused by that. It's going to burn the ocean. 
I mean, I guess I understand why they do that, but you can never know that. It just sets you up for potential failure. <laughs> what if you're wrong? What's that? There's a lot of potential there. Yeah, there's a lot of potential. Potential for a million acres. Is that any different than saying potential for a hundred acres? Got an idea. Potential. A lot, a little, or none. Whatever. <laughs> so box time. Okay, where are we at? Okay, so that's the size of a point source fire. Now, see how contain is under this under this one? It's like it's sort of related to it. And contain is something that is, we actually use this module quite a bit. It's also, it's, it's a pain in the butt. But we use contain for, uh, in, in the burn plan. What's that, Mark? I was going to say, uh, do you guys use this going on a big incident? And you know how you, in the SIG report? So you use the contain update so you guys Hmm. You know, you could, but that would be a malicious model to try to. I think that's more of a wag, to be honest with you. No, the main use, the main place that we use the fire contain module, is uh, on a on a in a prescriber burn plan. There's an element which is the um, it's the the holding plan, I guess. And what you have to do is you have to you know like most of the time we have prescriptions and they're set up low, moderate, high. And what you do uh, when you look at a burn plan. And on this, it's set it up, and it, so, so you have to build your organization to be able to uh, control the fire. On, and what we do is we use this contain module, and I'll show it to you, obviously. But uh, almost inevitably, on a lot of our prescribed burns at the high end, it shows that with the resources that we expect to be on site, we can't control the fire. So it's kind of interesting. So let's go look at the options, of course. We have input options here. And this is actually a pretty important one. Okay, and this depends on how you input things. And again, as burn plan writers, this is a module you will need to learn how to use, and it's, it's kind of a pain in the butt. So suppression input is entered for a single resource or multiple resources. Well, what do we usually have on a fire? Multiple. We usually have multiple resources, that's right. So we're going to change it to multiple resources. And then your output variables, um, whatever you want to use here, containment diagram, sometimes can be useful. Contain status is the probably the most important one here. So I'm going to click OK. It might bring up the size of the point source fire, but I'm not sure. So, yeah, that's right. That's, well, that's why it's related. Okay. So I'm going to click on size of a point source fire. We're going to go with that same, that same scenario. We're going to go with the fuel model 4. Um, so if you run that before, remember how we ran this? And it was like 80 acres. Let's, uh... Let's mellow things out a little bit. Well, now hell, let's go with it. Let's say the initial attack is, uh, I should say, oh, I know what it is. I know what it is. So, okay, remember what, did you see how, what just happened? Anybody see what just happened? When I clicked on size of a point source, what happened to Jose? None. Oh. I'm trying to figure out what happened. So, <laughs> all right, let me click, let me, let me take off size of a point source and let's see what is different. Fire size of a point source. Fire size of report. Okay, so you can either tell it. Do you see? Do you see how this is related then to the size? Because if you click this module, size of a point source fire, and you provide the inputs that are required for it, it's not asking you. It already knows that the size of the fire at IA is the 83 acres. Okay, so you can remember it's, it does a lot. Behave does a lot of stuff kind of in the background, and depending on how you put your inputs out or your outputs will depend on what's going on here. Again, I want to reiterate, you have to look at your inputs and see what's on here. So, we can either use that calculated 80 acres, or we can get rid of that 83 acres, or we can say, you know what's more reasonable is if there's a fire that starts at the bottom of Palomar Mountain, let's say it's going to be five acres at the IA, or three. Let's say it's three acres. That's reasonable. Okay, this is where you need to start understanding this stuff here. Uh, suppression tactic. We all know this, there's head attack or rear attack. Um, <laughs> this is sort of like Texas versus California. Uh, head attack is where fire line is constructed starting at the head of the fire and proceeds back towards the flanks. Now, we do that at times, right? If we can get to it, it's safe. But generally, how do we fire fires? Flake. So that would be a rear attack where a fire line is constructed starting at the rear of the fire on the heel and proceeds at an equal rate up both flanks. So for the intents, uh, for the purposes of us, we rarely attack shot fires from the heel. 
<laughs> Turn from the head. If you do, we should probably talk. All right, line construction offset. <coughs> so this is just talking about direct or indirect. Um, line construction offset is the distance from the fire at which the expression line is constructed. Um, zero indicates direct, while other variables indicates a parallel. So you can go anywhere from zero to 100 chains. Um, like 80, 80 chains is a mile, right? So you got basically 1.2 miles offset. Um, so let's say for our purposes we're doing a, uh, let's do zero. I mean, most of the fires that we attack, right, it's pretty much direct. Laying hose going direct. Would you guys agree with that? Okay, uh, resource name. Now this is, there's no input option to this. You see that? The resource name is uh, just simply a way for you to keep track of things. And what we do most of the time is we do E1, E2, E3, E4, and say C1, C2. What am I doing with E1, E2, you know, C1, C2? Engines and crews, that's right. I'm going to, for these, I'm going to do E1 and C1. So we have one engine. Actually, cancel that. You know, yeah, let's do E1 and C1. So you have one engine and one crew. It's in the off season. Okay, then you have your resource line production rate. You guys have probably seen this in the RPG or in other places where there's a table, and I'll show you the table of the line production rates, which again, these have also changed over the years, and I don't know if these are the newer production rates or not. But uh, this is the, there's a table down here. So you have to know a couple things. One, you have to know the fuel model. And you have to know the, the type of crew. So for a type 1 crew, so let's say Palomar Hotshots is attacking this fire and we know it's in Chaparral. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys only get five chains an hour. So that is going to be your line production for C1, be five chains an hour. Um, let's scroll down here. Oh, sorry, missed it. Hand crew. Line production rates for initiative. Oh, that's per person. Sorry. Yeah, that's if you if you don't have just like a standard crew configuration, you can you just know you have like some people. That's uh that's that's what you use. So each person in Chaparral is 0.4 chains an hour. Keep scrolling. This is engine crews and chains per hour. You have the same, you have the fuel models over here, you have the number of persons in the crew, so let's say it's summertime, it's 5.0 staffing, in Chaparral, 5.0 engine crew is doing 16 chains an hour. Does anyone take issue with that? What did I do? Oh, sorry guys, thank you. Chaparral, 20 chains an hour. So what was it for the hot shot crew? Five. Why is a five person engine crew putting 20 chains out and a 20 person hand crew is doing Water. Water puts fire out. That's right. It's assuming with an engine crew, it's assuming that you have water, and water does put fire out. Um, but so it's kind of interesting, right? It's assuming you're doing a hose lay with water. If you have an engine crew that doesn't have water and all you have is the bodies, what do you need to do? <laughs> you need to go back to that five people times 0.7 chains an hour, so your engine crew is going to have, what's 5 times 0.7? 3 point something? I think it was 0.4. Oh, was it? Okay. 0 0.4. 0 0.4. So 5 times 0.4, that's going to be uh, 2. So your 5 person engine crew is going to be maybe 2 chains an hour. Okay? So that's the difference. It's assuming you're, you're dropping a hose light. So you have to be cognizant of what your crews are doing. Or, um, cognizant of what your resource is utilizing. So 20 and 5. Now, this is where it becomes important because you see how that 20, I put that under the E and this and the C is 5 because the uh, these start to uh, relate to each other and the resource name, it, it, I don't know how to explain this, but everything underneath it relates to it. So the first thing that you put for resource name the resource line production rate is going to relate to that first one, the E1. Resource arrival time is going to relate to E1, and resource duration is going to relate to E1 for all of the first ones. So, for example, E1 is going to be 20 chains an hour. The arrival time is going to be uh, 15 minutes, which is 0.25. And the resource duration, that means how long can they work? Zero to 20 hours. You can only do 20 hours as a maximum. 
So let's say 12 hours. You gotta work for 12 hours. So that's what E1 is. You're modeling a 20 chain an hour, 15 minute arrival time, 12 hour work shift. Your crew is five chains an hour. It arrives, let's say it arrives a little bit later, a half an hour, which is 0.5. But it also has a 12 hour resource duration. You have to set it up this way because what happens with people with this contain module is maybe you put three things up in the resource name, but then you just do, oh, well, they're, everyone's going to do 20 chains an hour, everyone's going to do arrival time, everyone's going to do 12 hour, and you only put like one in each one of those boxes, well, it'll crater. So let me show you what that looks like if you do it wrong. And you don't put, like you say, okay, well, I got two resources coming, but you know, you don't put all the input, it'll say, oh, you didn't, your resource arrival time has one instead of two values as for resource name. So it's saying you have, hey, dummy, you got two in the resource name, but you don't have two for everything else. You guys following that? Yes. Okay. Cool. So going back to the example properly set up, 25.5, 12, oh, can't have, can't have a space. Okay, now it should give you an output. So. This is what your, <laughs> your outputs look like. Uh, so contain status, that was one of the outputs. Um, withdrawn, what does that mean? What do you think that means? Yeah, that means, yeah, you gave it your best, but that baby escaped. <laughs> After 12 hours. Time from report, 12.2 hours. Your contain area is minus one acre. You, you actually did worse than when you started, <laughs> apparently. But you put in 293 chains in line. That's pretty good. It's pretty good, but 12 hours later they pulled you off. Um, so what this tells you is that with these, yeah, Mark. Go ahead. So just, uh, just real quick for the contain status, what are the options? Contain or withdrawn? Uh, can't remember what it is. There is can definitely contained, withdrawn. I think there's another one. I can't remember now what it is. So let's play with it a little bit. Let's. Uh, now, how can we do this? First, let's put these out at 20. Let's say you can work 20 full hours. Same resources. Well, you put in more lines. Of, all you did was work longer, but you still didn't put the fire out. So then you start stacking it up. It's like, all right, darn it. Well, let's do let's do two more engines. Or, let's do a head attack. Nah, we're not going to do head attack. <laughs> So we're going to do 20 and 20. Oh, we're really bringing it to bear. 0.5, 0.5. Let's say they got there. Everyone's working for 20 hours. Okay, now do we put the fire out? Oh, we still didn't put the fire out. It's really hard to put out chaparral fires, right? <laughs> uh, you put in 1,200 lines of chain. That's like 10 miles. This fire must have got pretty big. Oh, now I'm curious how big the fire got. I'm going to put this up back up. Size of a point source fire. Options. Area. We'll run it again. Area 83. Oh, that's this just at the. I, I can't mind. You need a fire spread diagram. Oh, I'm curious how big the fire got. Oh, I thought it would tell me. Yeah, it would tell me. If I really looked into it. Anyway, blah blah blah. Yeah, you want to do a head? Well, let's for shits and giggles, let's do a let's do a head attack. We're, <laughs> we're not attacking. We're attacking from the black. Okay, what happens when you go right for the... Oh, it escaped. Oh, okay. well, well, Dang, well. Yeah, we it. <laughs> Not a good idea. Yeah, you didn't even... You didn't even get any line constructed. You just freaking got burned over right away. <laughs> you have failed your Type 3 IC simulation. <laughs> board, board. We'll go back to rear. All right, all right, all right. Um, I don't even know. Let's do. We need more. In, we need a whole freaking strike team. Can, can you like, can you like do those? Or? Uh, whatever, man. Okay. That's too complicated. Twenty. Yes, you can do those. Yeah, yes, you can do other line production rates. Uh, all right. So this is where you start to lose track. How many? I got one crew. One, two, one, 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 one. I need more. Twenty. Do you want, all right, Smarty. Give me a dozer line production rate. Okay. And it, it arrives an hour late because they, they take time. Mm -hmm. I 
I'm waiting for you. <laughs> In fact, we're all waiting for you. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Waiting on one. Let me type two dozer and chaparral. Whoever gives me the answer first gets their shirt right now. Ooh, there it goes. You guys can care with that? Is it 80 teens an hour? Whatever. Is it 80? Is that right? You might concur with that? Eighty? Eight zero. All right, we'll go with it. Eighty chains an hour. Just a mile an hour. All right. If we got all the numbers correct here. Oh. Resource duration input. Oh. Oh, crap. I did the wrong thing. My bad. That's resource duration, not line production. Or depends on the slope. The resource arrival time has nine instead of ten values. Okay. Resource arrival time has nine instead of ten values, which means I. I didn't put enough people. One more for the bottom two. One more, okay. E oh, it worked. Oh, it's still withdrawn. But we put in almost 5,000 chains of lines. Twenty and a half and a half hours. What's that? Put them all as dozers. So, the cool thing about this contain module is that you almost never win. <laughs> like. You almost never win. Just want to have a bad day? Yeah. I lowered the wind and raised the fuel moisture. Say it again. You lower the wind and raise the fuel moisture. All right. We're going to play God. Zero. And put zero wind speed. And then ten for the one hour fuel moisture. Ten for the one hour, so it's like not even burning. <laughs> and then you win. Do we win? Hey! Contain. Woo! Good job, boys and girls. Twenty-one acres. It's not bad. But that, that was perfect though, you started playing with the inputs. So what you have to do with um, a burn plan is you have to look at your actual limits and like, so let's say for a typical burn, a prescribed burn, say in the timber, say what, three to five engines is available. What do we usually roll up on a burn? Maybe four engines? But it's usually like three of staffing, right? Handful of people, no dozers, um, and that's what and you can also, I mean, you can model your contingency, so you might add a few more engines onto that, maybe a dozer, because there's usually one around. But uh, that's what, so in a prescribed burn plan, you have to show that. Usually on the low end, it'll actually show that you can um, contain the fire. But on the high end, we typically don't. So anyway, that's the contain module. Is everybody cool with that? All right. No? Questions? There has to be a question. Yeah. All right. I personally... I don't think it's super accurate. I think that one's among the few that are among the ones that are not all that accurate. But. All right, moving on to spotting distance. Let's go back to the module so input page. Like Thirty miles of twenty-five percent slope. Yeah, oh yeah, and that's right, and that's why it's not accurate, right? It's because yeah, what was what five thousand <laughs> chains, and it's all up the slope. Yeah, obviously it's going to go down. It's the fire's going to slow down. You're going to find places to catch it. The humidity's going to come up, and again, that's twenty hours of peak burning time. So when you really would do this, you know, it would be like four or five hours of peak burning time and a bunch of heat and that sort of thing. So, All right, let's go spotting distance and the options to it. There's a few more, but they're all outputs. Um, actually, this is more of an input, but anyway, spotting distance from torching trees. Now, this is important for the prescribed fire class pre-works. I'm not sure 490, but I know there's a question relating to this where it's spotting distance from torching trees or a burning pile, and now they have wind-driven surface fire. But for our purposes, let's just do spotting distance from a torching tree. I think, yeah. We'll... No, you know what? Scratch that. Well, no, nah, yeah, let's do torching tree for now. Uh, and then there's obviously outputs, torching tree, burning pile, surface fire that only relate to how you input in on this one. So since we have torching tree, we're going to do, we have to click on one of these. I think it'll probably, you know what, let's not click on any of these and let's go, okay, and see what it, what it uh, prompts us for. So, here we go. So, first of all, I'm going to change the fuel model to something that actually is a timber model. Um, let's do, uh, oh, I like fuel model. Let's do 10. Downwind, downwind canopy height. Oh, here's another term we don't know. What's the downwind canopy height? So, obviously with spotting, most spotting goes with the wind, right? 
Um, so that just wants to know downwind from your torching location, how high is the canopy height? And uh, let's see if there's a diagram or anything. Nope. It may be different from. Yeah, because it's not the canopy base height, it's the actual height of the canopy. So it just means how tall the trees are, basically, the top of the trees. So what do we, what do you say, 180? Ooh, that's tall trees. That's right. Is that in the pre-work? Yeah. Let's do 100 foot tall trees. Torching tree height. Well, let's say that the same dang trees, 100 feet. Spot tree species. So it kind of wants to know what the, the species is. Now, there's only a list of, like, 15 trees, so you kind of have to get close. Um, so yeah, let's say it's again up on Laguna. We don't. I don't think Jeffrey Pine's on here. But Pondo Pine is pretty much the same as Jeffrey Pine, so we use Pondo Pine. Pin Pond. That's Pinus ponderosa. And then it wants to know what the DBH is. Uh, you know what the DBH is? Diameter of breast height. So the diameter of the tree at four and a half feet above ground level. So let's say 14 inches is the DBH. And it does some calculations with height and DBH uh, for some of the other ones we'll get into. I'm going to bring the one hour fuel moisture back down to five so it's actually burning. Let's see, does it change anything? I'm actually going to do five mile per hour wind. Why is it 20 foot up? Oh, because it wants to know up above. And it brings in the 20 foot wind speed. It's probably going to ask us for a calculated wind adjustment factor, so we'll have to see. And then this goes back to, remember, we talked about these ridge to valley elevational difference? That's just. The you know the, the elevational difference between the valleys and the ridges are out there. So let's say I don't know 500 feet. When you put that in, it gives the ridge to valley horizontal distance, and then that's let's see if we can bring up a diagram. It's always a good diagram. So you guys see this? This is the ridge to valley horizontal distance. So it's just the how from the valley bottom up to the top of the ridge. How long is that? So and it goes to zero to four miles. So that'd be a pretty wide valley. So let's do, I don't know, and it's in miles, so let's do 0.5 miles. So it's uh, 2,500 feet. And then down here, spotting source location. Well, we already, oh, okay, so he wants to know, is it ridge top, is it mid-slope windward, valley bottom, mid-slope leeward? I don't know, let's do worst case scenario, say your ridge top. So you're going to get some spots coming off the tops of the ridges. And then it wants to know, what's the number of torching trees? Well, I don't know, let's say a little group torch, top of the ridge, let's say three trees torch. Cool? Are you with me? Alright, what do we do now? We go up here, press the output. Okay, so again, remember how it had that 20 foot? Whenever you get into that 20 foot, it wants to know about the wind adjustment factor, so we'll just do the default. Uh, we already had, the, because we've been using the same sheet for this time, the point three is already in there, so we'll just keep that in there. It brings up the wind adjustment factor. Run it, and all we're again with spotting. All we're looking for is spotting distance, which we you know this is something that they run for fires, you know, wildfires. But you might also want to know about it in a prescribed fire scenario. So what's the spotting distance? 0.3 miles. Point three miles. So that's how much is it? Eight. Eight. So would be about. We can do the math real quick. 5,280 divided times 0.3. There you go. Perfect. So anyway, 0.3 miles. And that's really it. That's how you get spotting distance. Now you can start messing with some of the inputs like... Um, oh, sorry. I always do that. Yeah, you, know, like you can mess with the heights of the trees, the downwind height. So like when you have an example in your pre-work, it should give you all this data. It should give you this information. All you got to do is plug it in. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're almost there. Crown scorch. Go to the options for crown scorch. Input. There's only scorch height. <laughs> so I would go with the default. Or that's the output variable. Okay, never mind. Yeah, this is the same thing we saw before where surface fire intensity is entered as flame length or fire line intensity. I'm just going to keep this as flame length. Was there a question? Everybody good? Okay. Cool. Uh, crown scorch. Uh, there's always a crown scorch question. So what's the new variable we're introducing now? Air temperature. Okay, what do you say? Let's say it's 65 degrees. I don't know if it's going to ask for anything else. 
I should be asking about treaty and stuff. Oh, well, let's run it. Okay, so in this scenario, in this field model, 37 foot scorch height. That's your scorch height. So it's going to scorch the trees on the bowl or in up into the canopies to a height of 37 feet. Make sense? Okay. So if I recall tree mortality, see how this is tiered to crown scorch? So I'm going to go ahead and take off crown scorch, put on tree mortality, and we'll see how the interaction goes. Go back to options. So output variables, you got bark thickness. And again, this is something that I know is on some of the pre-work, but the default is probability of mortality because this is the mortality module. I'm going to click OK. OK. What, what are the differences, if any? Oh, there it is. Mortality tree species. I think it's the... Oh yeah, it's a, so this is a much, much longer list of tree species. So all the way from elms, walnuts, junipers, whatever. Let's kill some what? The Michigan fans? Let's find something. Find something sexy around here. Incense cedar. Let's do incense cedar. I mean, you guys do whatever you want. Why is that possible? Yeah, stay highlighted. Or what did I do? Ow. I do not know what A's a glaze. That's a book eye. Is it? Oh, Esculus. Yeah, that's right. It is. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Alright, I'm already tired of this module. <laughs> All right, screw it. I'm doing logical plan. Pin con. You do whatever you guys want. Black oak. <laughs> it's Pinus contorta. You're not going to get a 14 inch freaking. Well, I guess you could. Right, let's do a 10 inch contorta. Ground ratio 0.4. It's about a 45 feet. It's about right. 65 degrees slope steepness. All right, let's see what see what our mortality is. Oh my God. So what's our mortality? 83%. So in this field moisture scenario, in the slope, in this wind speeds, in a ponderosa pine uh, overstory, 83% of these trees are going to die. Black, black oak. Did you guys, did anybody, did anybody do a different species? <laughs> How do you figure for, uh, for the for head, head fire and land back <laughs> That's a good question. That's that's like a pre-work question. Oh. Can I jump right to that? So if you were going to do that, what you might do is, uh, well, I don't know. Someone tell me how you going to do that. You want to know head fire backfire? What do we? How do we get to head fire and backfire before? Two different. Two different. Wind adjustment. Where was that? Direction. Back in the directions tab under surface, right? Surface fire spread direction is in direction specified on the worksheet. I'm going to keep the wind as upslope, I think, because I'm not sure what the thing is. So this brings up that thing that we saw before, which is spread direction from upslope. So yeah, it would be what, 0 or 180? <coughs> Click on that. And what, are we, what did you want to know? Any uh, mortality, right? Backing, backing end up. So 0. Is your head fire? 180 is your backing fire, right? See right here? Well, that's for head fire, 83, because that's what we had before. Because remember the way we had our model set up is we always have it set up for head fire. That's the default. But we put in 180 on that surface spread direction, and so it brought up backing fire. Um, let's. Go, I want to go back up and look at the uh, first output. So I wanted to make sure it was actually spreading. So I went uh, the rate of spread is 0.7. So backing fire through Pinus contorta through Ponderosa pine or uh, logical pine is less than one chain an hour. 1.8 flame length. So it, it hasn't reached. There's a threshold associated with every single one of these trees that it has to get to a sufficient fire line intensity and/or correlated flame length to kill the tree. Make sense? In this case, it's, it hasn't reached it. Let's see. I don't know, what can we mess with? Let's mess with the air. Let's say it's 90 degrees outside. 
Let's just mess with one of these factors. Is there going to be a change? Nope, rate of spread and all this stuff doesn't change. Does the mortality change? Well, <laughs> it goes up on the head fire. You're going to have a new top stand, but it's still not enough to back it through. So anyway, does that answer your question there? It doesn't, that doesn't answer your question? Yeah. Zero, one, eight, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It should. All right. So I'll, I'll break it down. So the steps. Module selection. You go back to surface fire spread. You go back to the directions. Remember when we talked about the directions? The default, the surface fire spread direction, the way the fire is going to spread, the default is only in the direction of maximum spread, so it's with the wind. Okay, a backing fire usually is against the wind or against the slope or whatever. So what I change that to is in direction specified on the worksheet. See that change right there? Right here? So when I did that, I pressed OK. I went back to here, I pressed OK, and it brought up this down here, which is the spread direction from up slope. So we'll go back to the, uh, the figure here. <coughs> So the spread direction for zero is upslope. The spread direction anti-upslope or downslope or whatever back in 180. So that's why I put in zero. Yeah, that's a new term. <laughs> Come on, if you hear it. Would be 180. So that's giving you a, a head fire straight upslope and a back and fire straight downslope. So that's a head fire and a backing fire. Do you understand? Are you sure? Yeah. That's why we're here, man. That's why we're here. I do not want you to lose. And that's, that's something that's, this is pretty important that you understand that concept, how to go back to that. Okay. Now where are we? We're trying to get some partial mortality in that lodge. Oh, I know what we need. I'm going to reduce the air temperature back to 65. Let's crank up the winds. One. <laughs> oh, it only goes to 40. It only goes to 80, actually. Oh. <laughs> Let's do a 40 mile per hour wind. It's kind of rip. What are we on? What are we on? Yeah. Okay, we're still doing. Well, let's yeah. go back. All right, it's a good question. What are we on? We're on surface fire and we're on tree mortality. I went rogue for a while. <laughs> you went rogue? Did you go off into the, into yeah. the Neverland? Yeah. We're trying to kill Lodgeful Pine, which is Pine's <laughs> Contorter Fincon. Air temperature 65, slope 25, we're doing back and heading, and I just increased the wind speed to a completely unreasonable 40 miles per hour. We're going to run it. What I'm trying to do, I can't, get, I can't get a backing fire mortality, so apparently if it backs against a 40 miles per hour, that is, that is down. I wonder if it, you know, I wonder if I reduced the wind speed, I wonder if that would do it. I wonder if it was like zero. No wind. It should be sitting in bacon, right? Oh, yeah. Well, the mortality went down all the way to either way. So I guess it needs wind. Again, it's a model. This is just playing with it. Anybody want me to do anything different with this? All right. Just got to play with it, man. Just got to play with it. All right. So tree mortality. That's mortality. And now we have the pig. Probably ignition. This is the last one. I'll put variables, probably ignition from a firebrand, or prob prob and they just they added probability of ignition from lightning, which is pretty cool. What could you do with probability of ignition from lightning? Lots you could put in lightning. like the weather variables from like observed weather and yeah. actual real yeah. inputs. If you're a, a bored whatever person that wants to do this, and I know you guys want to do this. We're like, if I'm going to get lightning. And then you have to count the number of lightning strikes uh. <laughs> that started a fire versus the number of lightning strikes that didn't. But you could probably do that if you really wanted to. Okay, so what do we got for... Okay, so fuel shading from the sun. What's in that same canopy? We, uh, this is, a, is it still a pin con? Oh, it doesn't care about that anymore. All right, perfect. Oh, God. Lightning and... You know what? I'm, Punky. I'm getting rid of the lightning because that's... that's dumb. What? We're going to do from a firebrand. We're, we're lighting a fire. We want to know what the pig is. Okay, that made it a lot easier. Fuel shading from the sun. What's the 0 to 100, I'm assuming? Yep, so let's say it's a 50% shaded canopy. Oh, that was the only input I wanted. Sweet. 
It already has some of this other stuff. Let's, oh, probably. Let's let's give it some wind. Let's give it five mile per hour. Yes. Okay. All right. Come on, come on. Firebrand ignition. Both uh, heading and backing fire. What's our pig? Sixty percent. So much easier than doing the find it, feel much your calculations and all that. So you just have to carry around your computer in the field where you're doing. Cool. All right, do we need a little break before we get into some examples or round back? Riley? Yeah. Questions? Oh, uh, yeah, question. So after you do your run, uh, what's the preferred way to save, save your... Okay. You know what? I'll handle that one after the break. Okay. Yeah. That's a good question. All right, let's take a uh, 5 10. Hold on your phone. That's actually probably easy. Uh, you know what? I should probably go back and review this. That always gets you confused. And then the output, the output's the same too. Yeah, save it. I think it's, yeah, I think it's save as well. We'll retain it. But I just want to verify. It's been a, I, honestly most of the time what I do is I just export the data and capture it elsewhere because I never really have a whole lot of like this. So I'm gonna fly. So I saved it as a run and a worksheet. So I'm gonna do a worksheet, my worksheets, pre-work run. Yeah. Okay. So what that does is the worksheet just say, just opens up the the inputs and all the stuff in the background. Let's do open run. That is the one that provides your data. Yeah. That's what you need when you need a base. Get this one. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
자, 여기서 
I wish Bob was here. Here's uh, over here. Yeah. 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 It's the fire block, uh, fire behavior handbook. It's a classic book. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Let's grab What's another that? one. You can't make me take one. <laughs> Not even if there's a fire. Ooh. All right, so the, the question that was asked uh, right before we left was how do you save your work? And this is important. Ooh. And this uh, this can trip some people up. So you want to make sure you know what you're doing. Part of the reason I asked for a break is because I had to go back and look at it because I kind of forgot. But now we know. Um, so let's say, so there um, a couple different things you can do. One, you can save as a worksheet. You can save as a run. And you can export results. Okay. Yeah, bam. And you can save as an image, too, for the record. Uh, it comes out as a JPEG. So we'll explore this a little bit. So the save as a worksheet, save as a run, this, this is where you can really disappoint yourself. If you go to a lot of trouble and you plug in all this data and, or you know, all these inputs and set it all up the way you want, um, how you save it matters. So the first way you save it is save as a worksheet and what we looked at and what it does. And by the way, so it, um, this is kind of a little tricky too. It comes up when you say save as a worksheet and it brings up a, stru a file structure. And when you install Behave, it set up this default file structure, which is totally fine to use. It's on your C drive. It's under the Behave folder. Uh, but the way it comes up is you have example worksheets. So it, it comes preloaded with some example worksheets. And then my worksheets are like your own. So like, for instance, I have pre-work one. We saved it at the break. We looked at it. And I've got a Fry Creek one. And I don't even know what Alpine Community Defense Zone, I guess, probably is what that is. Anyway, that's a Behave. Uh, plus worksheet and so but the worksheet is only this is the important oh okay wait, I forgot Let me back up you save as a worksheet it, the worksheet folder is the default you can select away from this but you have to put it in you um, and the worksheet description see how it says pre-work problem one that's what you write here in the description okay and then you can all and then you can save it as whatever you want um, I save mine as pre-work one and I want to say there's the caveat where you can't have a space in it. Um, so you just put whatever. You put pre-work 1 or pre-work 2 or whatever you want. Uh, so I'll put pre-work 2 and it's going to default. It's going to save into my worksheets. So I press OK. OK. So, OK. All right, cool. So I have all my data. So we leave behave. I cancel out of there. Or you accidentally click it. I open it up. I'm like, oh, crap. I want to go back to that worksheet. Had all those nice numbers in there. So I'm going to go to open worksheet, which is just above it. I'm going to go back to my worksheets, and I'm, I'm going to have pre-work 2. Oh, this is where people get super disappointed. Just because, what's missing? All the numbers. All the numbers are missing, aren't they? Crap. Which is not the end of the world. I mean, it doesn't take too long. But what it does do is all the background stuff and all the module selections, all your little caveats and selections, radio buttons you've hit, it's all there. So a worksheet is almost like a template that you want to use repeatedly. Um, so if you want to do a prescription, like you want to uh, model across a prescription, like a low prescription, medium prescription, high prescription, you can save a worksheet and then um, you, know, it, it'll, you can go and you can make the changes. But at least it'll have all the, the modules that you have selected in there. <clears throat> and then there's actually, let's see, there's some example ones. Let's look at the example worksheets. So basic start fuel model. Let's do surface crown. This is what's in behave. So this is what you need to get going for a surface and crown fire. Okay. It just saves you like 35 seconds worth of work to go into the module selections and select it yourself. And the fact of the matter, even if you pull up an extra one, you're still going to want to go and see what the defaults are, right? Because you want to have that control over what the inputs and the outputs are. Okay, so same scenario. You, you close it out. Oh, crap. I want to break it out. I, I want to get back to where I was started. What you do is you open a run, or in the first case, you save it as a run. So I'm going to open up run. I have my runs, which is the default pre-work one. Okay, this is right where we are at, what we've been working on all day. 
So when you save it as a, a run, it both saves the worksheet and it saves the actual numbers. Sometimes you only want that worksheet template. You don't want all these numbers because now you have to go and change all the numbers. Sometimes you just want that worksheet so you can put in the numbers and it, it saves you the time of having to delete and enter. You guys follow that? That's the difference between a worksheet and a run. And of course the way <coughs> the way that you save a run is save as a run. And it's the same thing. It's under my runs. Of course using examples runs. And I have one, and, you, and this is the other thing too, is you can set up your own folder underneath here if you want. And so you would just click on like RX341 and I have, uh, I don't even know why I did this, something in the past. Oh, RX341 from the class that we did. But my runs, I have pre-work, we're here and it's saved. All right, everybody follow that? Okay, so that's, what's, so that's how you save a run or a worksheet, and those are the difference between the two. Any questions on that? Okay. So then we get into the exporting results because this, like when you when you do the results, these aren't these aren't super helpful for pulling into a, a burn plan. I, mean, I guess you, you can't even like copy. You can't like you know select that or anything. So it has to be in a format. Uh, so you go back up here. You go. Let's start exploring with this. It's been a little while since I did this. So first of all, I think you could save as an image, which I think. Yeah, is it a bitmap? You can change it to a bitmap or a JPEG. This would be a screen capture. Oh, ah, what the heck? Let's see what it looks like. Capture file. Let's do pre work one. We'll keep it as a JPEG. Put it under captures folder, my screen captures. Press OK. All right, I'm going to show you the root structure. Go back to the C drive. And you go behave as it pulls up under the C drive. Exports. Uh, oh wait, yeah, that might actually be under here. Yeah. Sorry, it's been a little while, so I'm looking for it right now. Yeah, here it is. Okay, so you go to behave plus five, and we'll come to this exports one in a minute. Go behave plus five, default data folder, and it should have. Where's the screen? Oh, it doesn't have the screen. Maybe it's capture. oh capture folder. Yeah. My screen captures, pre-work one is right here. However, all this does is that it's it's the screen capture, so whatever the screen is, so you would have to do one of these for each one of those uh, output screens. Now, if it's a simple output screen, that's no big deal, and you could do it this way, uh, but it really is just a screen capture. So, but what's really more useful is when you actually can um, capture the data, the data itself. And see if I can remember how to do this. Uh, I like to go to export results, to export results. And then the default is in HTML. I know I've gotten this to behave before. I think what I do is I go to export results. I'll give it a file name. Again, this is under the uh, exports folder. I'm going to give it prework1, which is going to be prework1.html. That's a internet-based um, output file, so I'll press save. Uh, it says, that's right. So it says it saved it, and then there's a note that says you can open this file using Excel and subsequently save it as an Excel file using save as. So let's see if we can do that. So press OK. I'm going back to that C drive, behave folder. Uh, I think it's under exports. Uh, let's see if it puts it under. Sorry guys, I'm just looking for it here. Oh, yep, there it is. Okay, so it's actually under behave plus five. I must have created that other folder at some point. In the default data folder, export folder, and then there's the pre-work one HTML. So I'm going to click on it, and I think it'll just bring it up as a, see how it brought up the Internet Explorer browser? Um, I. Let's see if we can save as an Excel file here. No, not like that. I think you might have to try to open it with Excel. And somebody jump in on here. This is where I start to get fuzzy because I haven't done this in a while. Open with. Right you want to do open with? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. See if it'll work. <coughs> so I'm going to Microsoft Office, Office 14. Yeah, that isn't going to work. 
Hmm. Let me show you what I usually do. It's kind of so. This is one of the problems that people always always get with this. Is it's hard. It's actually hard to get the data. I think most of the time, what I end up doing is I end up just saving it all, doing copying it. So like you know, right click, copy. I think I end up going to Excel and dumping it in. I want to see if this works. Yeah. So y you can do that, and uh, it's not too bad. But what you end up having to do is you end up having to work with it to make it look good, and it's kind of a pain. Um, so what I, I actually have, and again, this is just me, is I have a couple of these, I've built Excel templates for this where I end up dumping the data in, and then I end up just working with it for an hour or whatever, and you dump in the stuff, you know, you have to work with the columns and the rows and make it look all pretty, but if you work with, you know, it's just like any other Excel document, if you work with it, you can whip it into shape and make it actually look pretty decent. So to be honest with you, this is what I have always done. And I've actually made, I think I've made it look pretty good. Anybody figure out how to do that? Like I've never figured out how to save it as and then open it with Excel. I just, I when I did the 301, I, I printed it um, and it prints it in a fairly decent format and then mm -hmm. I just faxed it in. You just have to kind of tender it because once you, when you try to fax like 20 pages in, like it'll get jammed halfway through. So I just kept calling late to make sure it ran. Copy copy that. Um, so in a burn plan though, I mean, what you want to do is you want to try to reduce the number of pages you have. And so that's why I take the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're saying is totally legitimate. You literally just print out the, ex the, the results. Like back in Behave, you can just print those results. Mm -hmm. That's fine, but for the purposes of prescribed fire burn plan, you know, you want it, you don't want it to be, you don't want to do that if you can help it. You want to try to get the data, and this is one way. So just to review, what you do is you go back um, to the actual HTML file, and then what I do is I just literally just pull it, copy and paste it, and for some reason when you dump it into an Excel file, file copy and paste, it it puts it into cat, it puts it in a rows and columns and Again, you can just kind of work with it, you know, like make the I want to make this be in the middle and that sort of thing. So with just a little, I mean, look, I did like two minutes worth of work and it already looks better, right? So, and you can do that across sheets. That's the best advice I got for you for exporting. That's the one big weakness with this is that it needs a tab to just export it directly to, into Excel or some other spreadsheet, but for some reason it doesn't. Whatever, it's a government product. <laughs> Clear? Cool? Questions? All right. Any questions at this point? Okay. So, what I would say is that this is probably a point in this class where I have explained behave nuts and bolts about as far as you can explain it. So, hopefully, you know, hopefully we have some questions, but hopefully you understand a little bit of the background of the inputs, the outputs, you feel that you can actually go in and maybe manipulate some of these things. If you have inputs, you know, you can uh, start to manipulate these worksheets and get some outputs and start making some reasonable assumptions. So that's where I feel like the class is at. So what I would say is that if you need to go, at this point, I would say you pass the class. Make sense? So we have reached the point of certificate in my mind. I know some people have things to do and I don't want to keep you too long. Um, at this point, if you stay any longer, you're completely on your own. Or what I mean is that you're staying here because you want to stay here. But you don't have to, and if you pick up and leave right now, that's totally cool with me. You've met the purposes of this class. Am I making myself clear? All right. So what, the only thing we'll do now is we'll start to get into some examples. And so at this point, all we're going to do is, is play with behave. I have explained it as much as I can explain it. Cool? All right. I'm going to give you guys a minute if anybody wants to pack up and leave. I don't care. I feel pretty good. I do too. You want to do some examples or you want to do our pre work at the Everybody else here is going to have a Rick even knows how to do it. Yeah. Troy knows how to do it. Clint said he would help me out too. Yeah. Like he remembers. We have it all here. So I just need to do my pre-work in a couple days. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah.
Because, like, I could go over this. Might as well just figure out my good points. Yeah. I know, I know, I know, I know. It does, actually. You know what, I think I've seen that. Uh, thank you. All right, those of you who are leaving, get out of here by 3, and at 3, we'll uh, start in with the pre-works and other stuff. You guys take it on? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it was really good. We'll get you certs and everything. It just, I, you, you said you got to kind of play with it, so. You got to play with it. Oh, my you guys split two? Yeah.
Okay, what's up? I got a 